it is clear that the Fed has policy in a restrictive place. The policy rate is certainly restricted and it's certainly feeding into the economy. By June, they will have enough information in terms of how restricted that policy rate is becoming. If the economy slows a lot, the Fed will feel comfortable with cutting interest rates. There are a lot of rate cuts that are priced in in the near term that may not come to fruition. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your top story overnight. The US and UK launching more than 60 airstrikes on Houthi targets in Yemen. TK, breaking news. It's the United States, but it's also an allied effort. Four, five, six nations involved, but particularly the United Kingdom. It was fascinating, uh, John, as this story broke, to see the US treatment in the New York Times, Washington Post, Bloomberg, and all also in London, the Times of London, the Telegraph, and it wasn't that it was two different stories, but there was sort of the shock of an allied effort. You know, that's how I'd put it. Houthis responding to this as well now, Tom. All U.S. and U.K. interests are now legitimate targets. That's their response in the last hour or so. The President of the United States with this to say, let's pull up the quote just briefly. We wanted to send a clear message that the United States and our partners will not tolerate attacks on our personnel or allow hostile actors to imperil freedom of navigation in one of the world's most critical commercial rounds. TK, you wonder if this is a one-off or if there's more to come? Well, I hear more to come within the experts that we're hearing and to have Norman Rule with us here in a moment. An incredibly busy day, John, but to have Mr. Rule with us again with his CIA experience, I think the brief will be really timely about the more to come. Things are pretty calm in markets. Let's go through the price action and look at the scores. In the equity market on the S&P 500, you wouldn't have a clue anything was happening. We're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Yields are going nowhere. The 10-year, 397.48. Crude is going somewhere, Tom. Almost 75 on WTI, up by 4%. <clears throat> on Brent crude, back into the 80s. Yeah, the, the, you know, it's a jump here. And what you do on the uh, Bloomberg uh, terminal folks is you look at the standard deviation distribution and I want to make clear that a pop up to 80 is well within two standard deviations. But you're getting there. I'm going to say 82, 83 on Brent is much more of a strain to the price system. It is such a busy finish to the week going into the weekend. Just go Unreal. through the schedule, the brief this morning, starting with the bank earnings. JP Morgan, Wells, Bank of America due out around 6.45 AM, City at 8 o'clock. All four banks, TK, reporting through this morning. Yeah, and Marcus Stroman to the New York Yankees. I mean, that alone gets you going. But, you know, there's a huge news flow here. John, have we ever seen this? Have we ever seen three or four banks? It could be in a space of 15 minutes. I don't recall that. They used to spread them out. Give us some breathing room. It often feels that way. You've got to wait yeah. for Goldman and Morgan Stanley next week. You wait a half week. hour that. But, you know, there's going to be an awful lot coming at you folks. And, what I find interesting here is the partition between these successful big banks removed from the pri property market, commercial real estate, versus all the other banks, which in a week or two will be just as important a report. It's not just bank earnings either. Earnings season well underway through this morning, 6.30 Eastern time. You're going to hear from Delta and the economic data. We had CPI just a little bit hotter than expected <clears throat> yesterday. Yeah. Tom, this morning, PPI, and we'll break down those numbers with Michael McKee, of course, and Mohammed al Arian a little bit later this morning. Ed Jardini publishing last night, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the bottom line is if you take shelter out of the inflation report yesterday, John, you're two-ish. I mean, that was the skew of shelter to that little bit of lift there. What are we doing with inflation? Ed Jardini takes out shelter and he says, you know, it's really not all that bad. But to that point, Tom, you yeah. can learn something about the data and how the market responds to it. We often say that on this program. Look at how bonds responded. Initially, yeah. yields up. Well, what happened at the close? Yields down, bonds rallied through yesterday. 10-year real yield, folks, 1.80 is now a 1.72. And to dip there under, let's say, oil up or whatever, global slowdown, 1.69 would be a shock into the weekend. Things in the bond market, pretty stable. Things in the Middle East, anything but. Joining us now is Norman Rawls, Senior Advisor on the Transnational Threats Project at CSIS and former Senior U.S. Intelligence Official. Norman, good morning to you, sir. The first question from us this morning, overnight and through this morning, was that a strike on Houthi rebels or a strike against Iran? Good morning. 
Uh, the attack was a strike on Houthi rebels. It is a con attack consistent with the administration's uh, plan to have a gradual escalatory approach to the region. It certainly will degrade Houthi capabilities. Uh, it's unclear to the extent those capabilities will be degraded. It is unlikely to deter the Houthis from future attacks, although the Houthis will likely calibrate those attacks in discussion with Iran to prevent a more significant regime destabilizing response. Uh, Mr. Rule, Nicola Smith in The Telegraph has a really terse essay on the actual missiles that the Houthis have. And what I read out of it is this is, I, I see the stereotype in the media that this is a bunch of terrorists off on a desert island. That's not the case. They have very sophisticated missiles. For example, the USS Gravely's there, the Arleigh Burke uh, destroyer, and they've got some missiles here of real capability, including ASBMs. Do we underestimate their sophistication? No, and in fact, it's a uh, well-known fact among the governments of the region and Europe that the Houthis have acquired uh, powerful missiles and more importantly training from Iran and in Iran on those missiles to make them a, a lethal uh, a threat to the region. What is the difference for our ships at sea, at the Red Sea and frankly outside the Red Sea today? Now that this attack has occurred by the Allies, what's the new risk to our sailors? Well, the Houthis are certainly going to sit back and say, what do they have left? What has been damaged? How can they disperse and use other tools? We have to remember the Houthis still have a vast drone fleet, probably some missile capacity, uh, drone boats, uh, and uh, also naval mines. Now, a naval facility was struck as part of the attack uh, profile, but that doesn't mean that we have taken out all of those capabilities. And the Houthis, again, can use those as long as they keep the nature of the attacks below the level that would cause a very significant counterstrike. Norman, this effort has been led by the United States and the United Kingdom. What do you think we can learn? from the countries who were involved and the countries who weren't? Well, the United States and the United Kingdom, as usual, are very close partners, and their intelligence and military authorities would have coordinated very closely over the weeks prior to this. Within the region, we had support from involvement by Bahrain and the European Union from Netherlands. That doesn't mean these other countries weren't playing different roles for security in the region, but, but for their own political and security reasons, they could not involve themselves in the attack. And frankly, the United States and the United Kingdom had more than enough ordinance to undertake these activities activities between our missiles, the U.S. submarine, and the four typhoons launched from Cyprus. Can you take us into Riyadh and give us a deeper understanding of how Saudi Arabia will be thinking about this moment? Saudi Arabia has issued a muted response calling for restraint from all parties. Uh, the Saudis will probably be pushing a diplomatic initiative to send deterrent messages to the Houthis and to the Iranians. Uh, I'm not sure the impact of that, but the Saudis also have to recognize that if the conflict were to escalate, it would impact their uh, security issues and the international community has not shown much appetite for uh, working against uh, Yemen in the long term. So they have to be careful. If you're going to involve yourself in Yemen, what's the plan? How does this end? And are you going to be with us as long as it takes? And the United States right. and Europe have not demonstrated that interest. Norman Rule, Bahrain near Qatar, sandwiched between Kuwait to the north and UAE, Dubai and Abu Dhabi to the south at the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, I should say. Uh, the, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at Bahrain. What is their relationship to the other Arab states? Are they alone this morning or are they acting in support uh, with, with su the support, I should say, of the other Arab nations? Well, there's no opposition to Bahrain's activities. Bahrain is not the largest country in the region, but it consistently shows significant leadership on issues ranging from the Abraham Accords, on opposing what Hamas did on October 7th, and on its support with uh, allied and partner military activities. Uh, the Naval Nav Cent, our Naval Command Center in the region, is located in Manama, and the Bahraini leadership is, is a very supportive and reliable partner. What is the level of our intelligence this morning? You've been so good at outlining to us how we know what we know. That's always the worry. Do we have good intelligence after these attacks? 
The nature of the attacks demonstrates a clear and uh, uh, good understanding of the locations from which attacks have taken place. Uh, we have infrared satellite capability that, according to press reports, allows us to understand uh, whence attacks originate. So I'm confident that the intelligence behind these attacks and subsequent Houthi operations will be good and consistent with the past. I'd love your interpretation of a headline we got in the last hour or so, Norm, and I wonder what you think about this. When you you hear the Houthis say that all US-UK interests are now legitimate targets. Norman, what does that mean? Well, Houthi rhetoric and Iranian rhetoric will remain defiant and strong, but again, we're likely to see Houthi attacks against shipping in, the, in their neighborhood. Their reach uh, is really not far beyond that. Uh, but again, the Houthis are going to want to calibrate this uh, for their own domestic audience and for the region as they move forward without, again, in, getting another major missile response, particularly one aimed at their leadership. This response was tactical in deterring and degrading activity. It was not strategic. It was not aimed at leadership or destroying all Houthi military assets. And again, we're managing that escalatory ladder, and the administration in London are doing this carefully. The administration and Westminster will have to manage the domestic reaction as well. Norman, this came from Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister. Described the hits on Yemen as limited, necessary and proportionate after weeks of dangerous and destabilizing attacks. The electorate, and I think domestically within the United States, within the UK, are going to be increasingly worried about their countries, their nations being drawn into this tension in the Middle East. Norman, would you describe what we saw overnight through this morning as a one-off? Or are we setting the stage for a repeat of this through the next few weeks? The British Prime Minister's statement is accurate and, care and crisply uh, said. Uh, we hope it's a one-off, but that's really up to the Houthis. I think what we have to look at is whether a Houthi counter strike will be uh, symbolic, uh, meant to show defiance, or really something that indicates that they haven't got the message. If the latter is the case, there will certainly be a, a broader strike by the United States, probably the United Kingdom. But again, it'll be carefully calibrated to move up the escalatory ladder. Not Either Washington or London are interested in an all-out conflict in the region. And, Norman, and Iran the, and the who know this. At the moment, you're comfortable that there is some kind of distinction between Iran and Houthi rebels, because a lot of people struggle with that idea. You will note that in the U.S. statement on the attack, Iran is not mentioned, although in any explanation of the uh, attack and the problem set, Iran is always described as being behind this activity. Iran will attempt with difficulty to deliver new weapons and provide support to the Houthis, but the naval capacity in the region will likely disrupt that. I think the broader problem is going to be the capacity of Iran's embassy and the people involved to provide intelligence and counsel to the Houthis as they deliberate their way forward. But that's the nature of the relationship between Iran and the Houthis. Norman, we're very lucky to catch up with you, sir. Thanks for your time. Norman Rule there of CSIS. You're seeing the consequences in the market turn to crude uh, by 4%. I wouldn't call this a major move, Tom, but we're back in the 80s yeah. on Brent crude. <clears throat> Buttressed up against two standard deviations. As I said, 82, 83 gets my attention. We're not there yet. People saying that oil surging. I just think that's uh, not, the it's not the right word right not now. Not quite. Not quite, but Lifting. we're seeing business. We're Lifting. seeing business have to respond to this, Tom. The disruption in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. First, we started to see it affect shipping, AP and Molomesk, the yeah. container shipping giant. Then you start to see it affect business on the ground in Europe. This from Reuters on Tesla, partially halting work at the Model Y sport utility vehicle plant near Berlin because suppliers have got to shift transport channels off the back of this tension yeah. in the Red Sea. Yeah, Lee Klasko is uh, world class on this at Bloomberg Intelligence, and we had a lot of perspective yesterday. And there, there's a big, big number on the disruption of the billions and billions and billions of dollars. And as you make clear, it's 10, 11 days around the Cape of uh, Good Hope. You know, it's, it's just longer, period. We've got a lot to get through this morning, not just our top story. We've got to talk about bank earnings as well. Ken Leon of CFRA reacting to Good. bank earnings a little bit later on this morning. JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, all due in the next half hour. After that, we've got to talk about City. We need to talk about PPI, the economic yeah. data, Tom, of the last 24 My hours. My message is each of these stories is different and unique, and Leon and our team will uh, slice that apart. Here are the scores this morning on the S&P 500. Equities pulling back just a touch with negative 0.1%. Yields are higher by a single basis point, 3.98 on a 10-year. And crude rallies advancing 4% on WTI, $75 a barrel on Brent. Back in the 80s from New York City this morning. Good morning.
2024 nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. I think March is probably a too early in my estimation um, for a rate decline because I think we need to see some more evidence. The December CPI report shows that the job isn't done yet and that we're yeah, on the FOMC, as you know, are committed to finish the job um, of getting inflation back to our 2% target. But, but the important thing to realize is that that disinflation that's been happening has happened while the labor market conditions remain healthy. I think March is probably too early. That was Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester speaking with our own brilliant Michael McKee, signaling a later Fed cut than some of the markets may be anticipating. Sure. City, Andrew Honhorse echoing some of that yesterday. We continue to see March as too soon for the start of rate cuts. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. The state of play in financial markets looks like this on the S&P 500, heading towards a week of gains this morning, just a touch lower. We're negative by zero. 0.1% on the S&P 500. Into the bond market, yields are higher by a single basis point, 3.9786. And crude on the move, Tom, following those strikes by the United States and the UK. Very close to 75 on WTI, 74.90, up by 4% here. Brent crude back in the 80s, $80.40. Thank you to Norman Rule for being with us. Seems almost day after day, but with his expertise, it's just hugely uh, valuable. John, you know, I, I look at the inflation debate and what Michael McKee accomplished with uh, uh, Loretta Mester of Cleveland. And to Edyard Denny, I guess inflation sort of disappeared, particularly goods disinflation and outright deflation, except shelter. And somebody needs to explain to me how the Fed can act before they see shelter come in. They have to wait to see the shelter vectors turn around. I mean, it's just, that's borderline religion. So go through the Canada TK. March feels too early for you based on I, that? I, no, I want them to cut in January, but that's not the issue. The issue is they're ex post, they're after the fact, and they just have to wait to see shelter crack. There's no end of for buts about I think that. some people agree with you. Yeah, I mean... I, I Whether they should be worried about what's developing in the labor market, Overall headline payrolls growth looked pretty decent. I think some people yeah. would point towards some cracks elsewhere, but yeah. overall the headline number still looks pretty good. And we need more data that'll keep us going, uh, to say uh, the least. This is an important interview now. We get out front of bank earnings this morning, but also on the equity markets with all sorts of good experience with Franklin Mutual shares. Katrina Dudley joins us uh, this morning. Katrina, I love how you push against the earnings are gonna be better than people expect um, idea. Help me with that. Our earnings, going to be tepid and why is my key question look if we look at earnings growth expectations going into the year they're at about 11 percent growth so that's a fairly you know f high rate of growth given some of the headwinds that we're talking about you know we are talking about interest rates and the full effect of interest rates coming through you've talked about the strength in the labor market and that strength in the labor market <coughs> still is not reflected in corporate earnings because you're not really seeing those wage increases come through so there's some of the pressures that we think are going to mean that earnings growth is going to come in slower than the market expects. I mean, how much slower? I mean, we're talking, I think I think we're modeling out mid-single digit, and there's all sorts of people, including Bloomberg's uh, Gina Martin-Adams, making clear we could see a nice surprise beginning with this morning's bank earnings. You're just flat out pushing against that, aren't you? We are. We're flat out pushing against that. I think that, you know, the expectations are actually pushing closer to the double digits on earnings growth. We think that, you know, single digits will be one of those things where a CEO can kind of mm -hmm. do that proverbial tap on the back. Um, and there are, because they've got a lot of headwinds to deal with. And we think that the markets are tepid. We don't think that the, the ability to get pricing power is as strong in 2024 as you right. saw in 2022 and 2020. 
2023 where we had supply chain issues, we had shortages of product. And so that the price mechanism is the way that you offset these cost headwinds. We're not sure that they can do that. You've got five surprises to start the year. I just wonder if what's developing in the Middle East right now is one of them. It isn't. It, it, I think that we've, we, we, we look at what happened in 2023 and we already have seen escalation around the world in various pockets and this is just a continuation of that escalation. Um, one of the, you know, so our five surprises are actually not, you know, more turmoil in the water world. I actually have to say that I hope for less turmoil in the world because, you know, we're going into a cycle. One of the surprises we did talk about is the election cycle that people are not focusing on. We're, we're, we're here in the United United States, we know what's happening in November, but people around the world are going to the polls and that is going to cause some level of turmoil across the world. Are they a group of idiosyncratic stories or is there a broad theme? connecting these elections? Um, I think in terms of the connection of the elections to the United States is there's a lot of reactionary policy. That's one of the things that we saw in 2023. Um, we saw company, you know, we saw the United States come out with green policy and then Europe updates its green policy because company, countries are realizing they're almost like little mini companies. They need to be competitive. They need to have policies that are competitive. As we go through an election cycle, we will have new policies mm. coming out of new candidates and that's going to change the world order. I digress, but it's in the ether right now. And that is not the death of ESG, but a readjustment of ESG. Speak for Franklin uh, Templeton. Speak for all your Heritage at Mutual series. Is ESG a once-off of a few years ago, or is it forming into something new and different? I think that ESG is now integral into the investment process. Um, you know, when I started my career, and it was 20 years ago, you know, we, we were very heavy on the G, the governance side of things, so holding right. companies accountable, you know, looking at pay packages, making sure that there's that linkage between corporate earnings. Um, now we're focusing on environmental. We're looking at what does their product set say, how well are they positioned on an environmental basis we're looking at the social how are they positioned as it relates right. to their workforce but it's part of the analysis it's no longer a separate yeah. category that's the difference i'm fascinated john what you and uh, lisa and amory see in davos here in the next week about a readjusted esg off of the enthusiasms of two say two winters well ago. i think most people would agree on the ultimate destination set by governments around the world i think where there's some disagreement at the moment katrina is on the speed at which we get there do you see some companies moving too quickly than others we had to see a move from hertz yesterday dumping twenty thousand evs but simply because the demand wasn't there are there some companies that are going too fast I think in the Hertz example, it's, it's a reflection of the fact that if you think about when you're renting a car, you don't know the area you're going to. And so we need a technology that can help people map out those charging stations. So it's really showing a gap in the market where we need to have the technology solution to support the kind of hard solution, which is the EV reducing down the emissions. So I think that that's the reflection. In terms of companies getting faster, you have to. You cannot be the last person closing down that coal-fired plant. We had a conversation yesterday with someone who pointed out that the conversations we're having here in America are very different to the ones taking place in Europe and China. The EV reality checks that we're getting at the auto manufacturers, GM, Ford, the car rental companies, Hertz, yesterday. Do you hear any of this whatsoever over in Europe? In Europe, I think in terms of ESG, they're much more developed in terms of the narrative and the companies, if you look at the company reporting, you look at the infrastructure and everything, it's much further along and it's a much more developed narrative. And I think that that's what's reflected in the conversations. As you head over to Davos, you're going to be you know, really in the center of things, hearing about what CEOs are saying and what CEOs are talking about as it relates to ESG. And I think that that's where you're going to, going to get the barometer of how important it uh, is. To 2024. I totally agree with Katrina on this, John, and that when we were in London, I, I was unprepared for how green London is versus the American dialogue, and that doesn't even speak to the continent of Europe. I think yeah. that, you know, the, the fact is, though, that London's much smaller of a city, and that's one of the drivers of things like EV adoption, because you know that there's not that many miles or kilometers that I you need to I got a Tesla drive. for sale. Are you interested? <laughs> 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 the range anxiety is real, Tom. It's, I, it's real. In I, this country, it's real. And, and they're the great essay. I'm going to give credit to Business Insider. I don't know where I saw it. You go out and you actually rent a Tesla from Hertz, and you've never driven an EV before. It's true. And a lot of people were doing that.
It's true. Katrina, good to see you. Katrina Dundee there of Franklin Mutual Series. Billy V, busy 30 minutes coming right up. Bank earnings in America. You'll hear from JP Morgan and Bank of America. Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets joining us very, very shortly. Looking ahead and reacting to some of that as we look ahead to more data later this morning. PPI, 8.30 Eastern Time from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, earnings just around the corner. JP Morgan, Bank of America on deck. Going into it, the scores look like this on the S&P 500. Futures lower, negative by 0.14% on the Nasdaq, down about a third. Heading towards a week of gains on the S&P, higher by something like one7 or 1.8%. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Tension in the Middle East. You do not see it in the bond market. Yields are higher by a single basis point, 3.98 on a 10-year. You see some of it in crude. Crude, back in the 80s on Brent. Brent this morning, $80.55, up by a little more than 4%. WTI, Tom, reclaiming 75. Yeah, it's banded up there against two standard deviations. It is not a surge, but it's a nice lift in price off of what we see, the allied effort against the Houthis. But uh, just to be as, as simple as you can, John, 82.83 gets my attention in terms of a a more robust language. I'm not there yet on Brent Crow. Let's get you the latest this morning. Under surveillance, escalating tensions in the Middle East. The US and UK launching more than 60 airstrikes on Houthi targets in Yemen. The biggest attempt yet to stop the Iran-backed group's attacks on ships in the Red Sea. The president saying the attack sent a, quote, clear message. The Houthis vowing to respond, Tom, with counter-strikes. We're learning. It is about the technology, but also the allied response, including Bayren, is there as well, maybe representing the Persian Gulf. But it's a group effort. And, and as you mentioned, mentioning the prime minister early this morning, very clearly, Britain alongside the United States, we're not alone on this. Well, let's get to the quote from Rishi Sunak, the British prime minister, describing the hits on Yemen as limited, necessary and proportionate after weeks of, quote, dangerous and destabilizing attacks. Just how limited, Tom, yeah. will this be? Or what is the next one? Is it limited? I mean, this was Norman Rule, who's the expert on this, making clear this was a tactical exercise and not strategic. And you wonder of the risk of further tactical attacks or responses, I should say, and does it shift to becoming a broader, more strategic effort against the Houthis or against Iran for that matter? Already talked a lot this morning about how stacked the Canada is just for this morning and the next 30 minutes or so. Earnings minutes away from JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, all due out this hour, City out a little bit later this morning. The banks, Tom, bank stocks enjoying a bumper fourth quarter. KPW banking index up well, almost 25% since October. I'm glad you mentioned that. I guess there's some challenges here on costs. They're all going to come out within two minutes of each other and make for the worst 20 minutes in surveillance history. But, <clears throat> John, you know, I, I, I look at this and I go, once again, JP Morgan's going to really undersell the profit machine it's begun, even if they announce layoffs, cost reductions, whatever. It's like, oh, we, well, we, didn't, met, we didn't mean to make those tens of millions of dollars. And then raise the outlook, <clears throat> which yeah. is sometimes what happens. We've got no idea if that yeah. happens anytime soon, but yeah. we're about to get numbers from them in just a second together <clears throat> with Bank of America. Tom, the latest on BlackRock. We've got a deal this morning. Interesting. Buying global infrastructure partners for about $12.5 billion. The acquisition is the biggest deal in more than a decade for BlackRock and will make it one of the biggest infrastructure investors. Yeah. Coming up a little bit later, 9.45 Eastern, Bloomberg's David Weston sitting down with the CEOs of BlackRock and GIP. Yeah, uh, Mr. Ogunlesi is, is well known from Credit Suisse days long ago and I believe McKinsey. But what's interesting here, John, is infrastructure here, folks. Big topic at Davos, I should point out. Macquarie sort of leads the way when we talk to Thierry Weissman, among others. But, John, what's interesting here is the acquisition today of Lawrence Fink of Gatwick Airport. Can we talk about the drive from the city at 4 Please p.m. to don't. Gatwick Airport? Would you explain to our American audience well, Tom, the LaGuardia of the United if Kingdom? If you grew up north of London, to go down to Gatwick was like JFK on steroids. Yeah. You, know, you get caught in that traffic, not great. But I think for BlackRock, Tom, after the job cuts that were announced earlier this week and the big changes that he's looking for in the asset management industry to go into private markets, to go into worlds, to expand there and make a big acquisition like this, I think it's more than noteworthy this morning. You wonder how many people are bidding for this. It also includes a Suez operation. You wonder if that's around the Suez Canal uh, as well. Let's dive into this right now. And the banker and is going to try to get this in here at 6.33 Wall Street time. Gerard Cassidy, 
uh, joins us. Uh, he's a large cap bank analyst at RBC Capital Markets with decades of experience. What will the cost reductions be, uh, Gerard? I mean, I mean, I get they're going to come out and they're going to manage that, but is 2024 beginnings with this earnings report a year of cost reductions for these major banks? Tom, I think there will be an increased focus on reducing costs, no doubt about it. The banks are striving for positive operating leverage. And as you know, the net interest revenue numbers will start the year off on the weak side because of the margin pressure that the banks are experiencing. We expect that to inflect, though, sometime in the first or second quarter of 24. But to your point, we do expect to see further announcements of downsizing of personnel. We've already had some announcements, right. as you know. PNC is an example. Of course, Citigroup's got a big restructuring going on. So, yes, Tom. I, we do expect to hear more about reducing costs. It was a good Friday, folks. I zelled in offspring. Gerard Kesson, you know, Zell works. How's the digital banking battle? Who is winning the digital bank wars? Tom, all of the major banks have incredibly good digital products. You know, when you think about the introduction of the iPhone back in, I think it was 07, 08, it really has transformed banking like so many other industries around the world, especially on the consumer banking side. But as we know, you can buy a very um, strong product off the shelf, which allows the smaller community banks to compete against the likes of Bank America and JP Morgan with the digital product. And probably, as you know from your own personal experience, there's a, only a handful of app or uh, transactions we do on a phone. So you don't need all the bells and whistles. It's like the old VHS machines, Tom. We only use them to play um tapes and maybe record, even though they had all those other bells and whistles on it. Such Same thing with digital apps. He's, he busted my jobs. Just he, a little bit. He knows you have no clue what we're talking about. I remember VHS, Tom. I was around for VHS. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. Sure. JP Morgan and, and Bank of America just around the corner. Before we get there, Gerard, let's talk about how to navigate these numbers from B of A. The one-time items you're anticipating how to really get a sense of the underlying business, the strength of the underlying business, what we look for. That's that's true, John. We're going to obviously, you know, exclude the one-time items. Um, everybody's going to have the big FDIC charge, you might recall, uh, from what happened last spring with the failures. So that's a one-time item that the banks will incur. But it's really going to come down to the core numbers, and that's going to really focus on two areas, the net interest revenue growth and fee revenue growth. And it, within the fee revenue growth, of course, with the big universal banks, we're going to be very focused on the capital markets numbers, especially for read-throughs for next week when Goldman and Morgan Stanley report. IB has been really soft. You know that, Jared. I'm just wondering where the pie hasn't been getting bigger. Which bank has been getting a bigger slice of that pie? How are they outperforming it, relative to other banks? Who's winning? Yeah, it appears that Bank America is showing the best improvement of taking a bigger piece of the pie. Uh, it, it's somewhat difficult on the trading side to really get a good handle on who's got the better market shares. The geologic numbers help us on the investment banking side because those are publicly reported numbers and those are good estimates that geologic has. And in that area, the, the dominant players, of course, are right. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and so we'll see if... Bank of America or City can creep up in their market share uh, in that area as well. Gerard, are they going to undersell their success here? I always, it's not a joke, folks. I'm serious about it when I say they almost have to apologize for their concentration and their success down the income statement. Is it the same old, same old this time around with these four reporting? I would say that. Um, they, got, they are going to be uh, very straightforward about the efforts that they're doing, the, the success that they're having, but also pointing out, Tom, that they're not only making money for their shareholders, but they're really investing in their communities. You know, the banking industry never really receives any credit for the amount of volunteer hours and money that's invest that they <clears throat> donate to communities around this country. And so it's a win for everybody when these banks produce strong numbers and they have been producing uh, strong numbers, these big four banks. Right. And I expect today we'll, we'll see some really impressive numbers. Jared, I, I, I believe this and I've, I've said this from the day I walked in the door at Bloomberg, we don't understand how big these people are. I just added up an approximation of how many people they have summed together these four banks are 989,000 plus employees. 
A lot of that's retail banking. Where's that statistic in five years? I, it's going to be interesting. I think that number, depending on how well they can grow, will probably be flattened down because of the <laughs> expectation over the next five years of increased use of artificial intelligence to really make the banks more efficient and more profitable. But nobody should expect those numbers to be down 20 or 30 percent because of new technologies. These companies, it's a people business, Tom, as you well know. Financial services is generally a high touch business in many areas. There is opportunities for digital banking as we as we know, but it's not a total elim elimination of the human touch, which is an important part of banking. George, stay close. Sit tight. We've got some numbers in just a moment from Bank of America and JP Morgan, Wells Fargo City, all coming up later this morning. Going into it, if you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just slightly negative. We're down by 0.2%. The tension in the Middle East continues to build. Crude is up by more than 4%, $75 on WTI. On Brent crude, we are in the 80s, $80 and about 70 cents. With us around the table to break down these numbers, I'm pleased to say, is Bloomberg Shanali Basak. Shanali, four big banks four different stories. What are you looking for? What is going to turn around the story for Bank of America, I think, is an interesting question. We started there. Can you imagine, John, that Capital One last year was up 42 percent and Bank of America only up 2 percent? Because people are borrowing on their credit cards. If you think about it, on one hand, it's that strict balance between being able to borrow and being able to not lose money on those loans. Okay, but to be careful here, Moynihan has to come out today. Does he have to address not concerns or fears, that overdoes it, but just a study of Bank of America's liquidity and insolvency position. Well, he does not, because Bank of America has really taken care of that problem over the last decade, haven't they? And, mm -hmm. you know, you could make an argument that investors maybe want Bank of America to take on more risk. Right. Remember, they have piled a lot of their balance sheet into bonds when yields were next to nothing. And so they have had that money tied <clears> up. <throat> that balance sheet is starting to roll off quite a bit, and you're starting to see their held to maturity losses starting to shrink as as well uh -huh. as rates rise, so the or rates come down rather. So they want them to put that money to work. Uh, remember, their average FICO score is higher than some of these riskier borrowers here. But does that mean they want them to lend harder? I think that this is the balance question of the banks, especially as uh -huh. delinquencies start to rise on credit cards. How much risk are you really willing to take on as a bank? Today will be all love and kisses. What happens in February? Do we see a lot of right sizing and rationalizations? Do we see announcements, or is it dribs and dreads? through the late winter. We've been talking about this, the culling. We have seen stricter the, the culling. cullings, right, um, at the end of last year. Look at that media, too. You know. Brutal. It, it, yeah. it is brutal. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely brutal. And remember, we saw so many job cuts last year. The hope this year is that things start to turn around and they can keep more people on staff. To Gerard Cassidy's point here, you did see Bank of America gain a little share in investment banking. And they also bank in the middle market where a lot of banks don't have that wide American footprint. And deals happen faster when they're less than $10 billion. We've been talking about banks for the last 15 minutes. Haven't mentioned last spring. Have we left that all behind now, the bank failures of nine months ago? Uh, yes. I mean, no in the sense that you are going to see those FDIC charges, but the idea of the severe crisis that people felt back in March, <clears throat> they don't feel that now. But we do see, see pain still, and you'll see that in places like commercial real estate. By the way, you'll also see it in places like auto and credit cards that could get messy in the coming quarters, as we see right. from Fed studies that delinquencies are rising. They all come out with their different PowerPoints. What's the first thing? Thing you look for? I mean, like 42 pages, let's say. What's the first thing Shanali Bassett goes to? I go to, you and I both do this, we go to the returns. At the end of the day, it comes down to the returns on tangible common equity. It comes down to the returns on equity. It's the best clean way to gauge the banks, but the profitability. And it's basically, except for Citigroup, big double digit, right? Is that a for generalization? For J.P. Morgan. Everybody else okay. is wavering against that double digit number and it comes down to the costs as well. Uh, those returns can't be gauged if you can't keep your costs under control. Interestingly enough, Bank of America had made that great move to increase their minimum wage to $25 per person in the next year or so, in the next couple of years. So they do have a cost base, uh, a big employee base that they have to contend to. 
while also managing how to bring in more net interest income at a time where people are overextended on loans. I don't think we've ever done this, John. It's 6.44 Wall Street time, and we're waiting for four separate button pushes at 6.45. <laughs> this Who is arranges unfair. this, Shanali? Like Whose fault is this? this? Whose fault is it? I remember that time Bank of America came out at 5.45 in the morning. <laughs> But Gerard Cassidy <laughs> remembers when there's carrier pigeons. I mean, you know, the pigeon, That's the, how they bird, used to deliver the, the bird would fly up from New York to Boston and he'd be at a Tucker Anthony Back in the days with, of a the HS. Out, with a big net out the window to capture the bird. We'll be drowning in these numbers responses. in the next five, ten minutes, Shanali, just quickly, <laughs> briefly. What do you make of that BlackRock deal this morning? BlackRock has been struggling to grow its alternatives business, and to do it in infrastructure is the one place it makes the most sense. If you think about um, their competition now, it's Brookfield. And you will wonder if they will dig deeper into those other alternatives like private credit that would, you've seen others really dive into. Would you suggest, uh, we're, going to, we're going to be very careful here with the time, of folks. We'll give you the banks the moment they come out. John will do that. I'm fascinated with if this was a bidding war. I mean, <laughs> Gatwick, Suez Canal, whatever it is, there's different there. And, and, and the basic idea to me is everybody else must have been bidding as well, right? These alternative asset managers, when I talk to folks in the market, they're all up for sale. <laughs> Everybody is up. Everyone is Is that looking. because now money costs something and everybody's for sale, right? And scale matters. Unfortunately, okay. scale matters. So if you're not big enough, then you're not invited to the party. <laughs> the <laughs> push days. into private markets has been absolutely phenomenal. I want to bring back in Gerard Cassidy of RBC as we wait for these numbers from JP Morgan and Bank of America. Gerard, the competition, private markets, deep banking. <sighs> Are these guys starting to eat the lunch of some of these big banks on Wall Street? I would say, John, they certainly have increased their competitive positions because many of the big banks that are regulated by the Federal Reserve, the controller of the currency, they've been de-risked. Following the financial crisis, as we all know, um, the Fed made a push to de-risk the large banks, and that's what's happening. But all in all, the shadow banking industry has been around, as we all know, for 40 years, and it has taken over a very large position of providing financing for companies in this country. It has intensified more recently, as you pointed out, John. And so the banks are competitive, but the private side has certainly taken a leg up more recently. Hey, Gerard, the numbers drop for BFA. Let's get to those numbers. There's a couple of one-time items in here that you need to strip out to really gauge the underlying business. She's not only getting a fuller picture of what's dropping. The stock is right now. We're down by 5%. They missed on a lot of um, critical figures here, going down to the core items here. For example, in trading, where you've seen them really punch above their weight, they did come in below estimates on fixed income as well as total sales and trading revenue. Importantly, also, they came in below estimates on net interest income. This is what we've been talking about, their ability to bring in loan lending money at the time when you do see consumers still borrowing. Are people going to slow down their borrowing activity if they feel overextended? The outlook for that is really really important here as we wait uh, for further communication from executives here. Provision for credit losses, while that came in below estimates, John, you did see charge-offs come in above estimates, which means loans uh, are starting to sour just a little bit more than Wall Street expects. The statement comes out, John, and is a generalization here, and Shanali and Gerard are the pros on this. Return on average tangible common equity goes from a 15-ish to 13 for Bank of America. So there's that key ratio ebbing away a little bit. Wells Fargo coming out as well, but let's just sit on the trading numbers out of Bank of America. Just for a beat, Shanali, 4Q trading revenue, as you pointed out, 3.75 billion, the estimate 3.84. FIC trading, can break it down from FIC trading to equities trading. FIC trading coming in at 2.21 billion, the estimate 2.4. Equities at 1.55, the estimate 1.4. Four, four. What would you read into that right now? Uh, they had zero days of trading losses. On one hand, that is great for a bank. On the other hand, remember, prime services, the ability to service asset managers and hedge funds, super competitive. Goldman has been trying to eat away at everyone's share. Uh, and so <clears throat> watching into next week how trading falls across the pack will uh, be important. How much risk are you willing to take on in this volatile market is the question for these banks. Shall I, global markets, Bank of America, Zero trading loss days in 2023. Is that good or bad? I mean, I mean, I guess they're bragging about that, but does that really mean they took no risk on their desk? It is a good thing. You don't want to see these banks losing much money. Uh, but to your point here, 
at this point in time, can you afford to lose a little bit of money? That is a big question here. Uh, it, it's a tough, tough balance. You have to remember we're living in a time where non-bank market makers are gaining a lot of share. Look at those Jane Street numbers, for example. Citadel Securities, we don't know what they look like full year. And remember, guys, trading activity bounced back at the end of last year. And so uh, Bank of America's competitive positioning, we have to wait for everybody else's numbers, but you want to see if they are uh, kind of holding their ground against the big guys. More numbers. Wells Fargo, I promised you those just briefly. Four quarter revenue, 20.48 billion, the estimate 20.35. Their stock is down by 2.6%. JP Morgan up next. We'll go through this piece by piece. 4Q Investment Banking revenue, 1.58 billion, the estimate 1.72. We talked about trading revenue over at Bank of America. Let's do that at JP Morgan as well. Equity sales and trading revenue, 1.78 billion, the estimate 1.93. FIT comes in at 4.03 billion, the estimate 3.84. There's a ton to get through here with JP Morgan. Just the early stock reaction, down 4%. Shnali, what do you see? Yeah, the, the interesting thing here is investment banking is not jumping back as quickly as anybody expects. Remember, even if deal making came back at the end of last year, you're not seeing the banks clip those, those fees yet from this activity. It takes a while for those fees to right. float in. Uh, remember, equities also below estimates. This is another competitive place on Wall Street today. Fees have been light the last couple of years, but that's a place that investors are expecting a bounce back as well. FIC came in above estimates, a whopping $4 billion. But is it enough to offset weakness elsewhere? We're keeping an eye on those provisions as well. Remember, uh, JP Morgan, at first glance, they're coming in above estimates <clears throat> for the provisions. Do they expect the environment uh, to be weakening a little faster than investors expect? Buried at the bottom of the very clear JP Morgan report, this is not CFA Institute work, John. Fortress principles. Book value up 16%, tangible book value up 18% at Fortress Diamond. A bit of commentary from Jamie Diamond himself, the JP Morgan CEO. Rates may be higher than markets expect. Inflation may be stickier than markets expect. We've had these kind of warnings from Jamie Diamond over the last year or so. Gerard Cassidy has had a bit of time to go through these numbers. Tons of numbers, Gerard. Wows. Bank of America, JP Morgan, put it all together for us. What's the story? It's certainly complicated because of all the one-time charges as we touched on a moment ago. But what caught my attention already is that the credit quality picture for the banks was was strong in the quarter. For example, in Bank America, the provision for loan losses was less than expected. And the charge-offs, in, in our estimate, were a little better than what we were anticipating. And so I think that's one of the messages for investors when you talk to investors, everybody's very concerned about the outlook for credit quality for the banks. And it looks like it's right. shaping up toward the end of the year to be pretty strong. But the investment banking results, capital market results are coming in lighter than expected, as you guys have pointed out. And Gerard, it's not the fine print, but it's on the edge of fine print. This is JP Morgan. Average deposits flat or down 3%, excluding their First Republic soiree. How do these banks react if yields come down and the money market fund wall migrates back to them? Tom, that's an interesting observation. The reintermediation back into the banks could certainly happen because, as you pointed out, the money market mutual funds, they're tied very tightly to the Fed funds rate. So if the Fed was to cut Fed funds this year, the money market mutual fund yields fall. The banks are a little slower to bring their yield down, so you could see that. But J.P. Morgan and the other big banks, as you know, are confronting quantitative tightening. Right. As, as we recall, under quantitative easing in the pandemic, we estimate that the Federal Reserve pumped four trillion dollars of deposits into the banking system and now they're taking them out and that's why yeah. you see some of these deposit numbers down let's bring james gorman retired into this from morgan stanley shanali basic with that important conversation recently at jp morgan wealth management roe of 31 percent that's the jewel of each of these banks i mean they they all want to be james gorman right it's incredible what they're bringing in in terms of margins from these asset and wealth managers and it is worth keeping an eye on but again tom if they can't make money at these other businesses it does dampen the story for even the profitable parts of the business we'll have Citigroup later in the hour they're making tons of money at their treasury and trade services business but markets investment banking are lagging and credit quality 
they're, you know, below Gerard's estimates, but they're broadly over the estimates of all Bloomberg um, estimates combined on average. And on cost, can you imagine? J.P. Morgan, which is among the best at cost control here for such a large bank, really able to keep a handle on their, um, their numbers here, on their re returns, they're even above estimates here on non-interest expenses. So keeping these costs under control for the top four consumer banks is going to be a very interesting balance this year. We're down across the board on these four banks by a little more than 2%. Gerard, slightly unfair of me to ask this question, given you've only had about 24 minutes to look at some of the numbers. In fact, less than that. I think you've had about 15. Gerard, based on what you have seen, who won the quarter? I would say that... Um it's, it's hard to say, but um, J.P. Morgan's numbers uh, look pr pretty darn good. Um, I'm interested to dive into the Wells Fargo numbers because they have been making real inroads into those trading and capital market areas that has been very beneficial to the fee revenue area. But overall, the important part, John, as we go through these numbers, is going to be what the outlook is for 2024. So I know we're going to focus on the earnings calls to hear what the guidance is for 2024. And if we are in for a soft landing and the Federal Reserve is finished in raising short-term interest rates, all four of these banks are going to be winners in 2024 as their business benefits from those types of conditions. Jared, thank you, sir, for the anticipation of these numbers and the reaction to them this morning. Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets. Just briefly and finally, Shanali, the guidance. What do you expect it to look like? On net interest income will be really interesting. They're expected to rise, and maybe that'll give a little bit more love to these stocks today. But the dr drop you're seeing is fairly dramatic. Remember, JP, uh, JP Morgan was already rich, fine. They were trading at 1.7 times book value. But uh, Bank of America was barely at book value heading into today. And so trading at. So, you know, these are pretty significant drops you're seeing pre-market. Uh, but also, the outlooks are not so far so rosy. So are we going to hear the bank executives start to turn that kind of caution around and start to throw some optimism? Or are they going to keep their investors on hold? Waiting for more clarity on the outlook, TK. But Bank of America down about 3% here. Tom, JP Morgan off by 27 <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to really parse it into this. Alan, Allison Williams will do it at Bloomberg Intelligence as well. John, just one idea of the modern bank. J.P. Morgan, active mobile customers up 8%. What happens to all those branches after 2026? We will stay on top of these numbers for you through this morning. Ken Leon of CFRA coming up next. Julian Emanuel of Evercore and Shanali Basak staying with us around the table from New York. Good morning. It is clear that the Fed has policy in a restrictive place. The policy rate is certainly restricted and it's certainly feeding into the economy. By June, they will have enough information in terms of how restricted that policy rate is becoming. If the economy slows a lot, the Fed will feel comfortable with cutting interest rates. There are a lot of rate cuts that are priced in in the near term that may not come to fruition. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Here comes earnings season, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow, your equity market on the S&P 500. Just slightly negative on the S&P. It's all about bank stocks. Let's take a look yeah. in the pre-market. Right now, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo out with earnings moments ago. IB a little light at JP Morgan, trading a little soft at Bank of America. But JP Morgan and the stock turns around. We're up by 1% in the pre-market on this, Tom. Drum roll. Forget the numbers. Look at the guidance. 2024 net interest income, about $90 billion, the estimate. Something like 86. And for Global Wall Street, we're doing it right right now. Gerard Cassidy with us and then Shanali Basic and have Ken Lee on here in moments. Uh, John is the way to do it. But critically, Julian Emanuel will join us working with Ed Hyman. And he's got a pretty cautious view on the 2024 for these banks. Ken Leon coming up a little bit later as well. He's going to join us in about two minutes' time, so don't miss that. Here are the scores this morning. The S&P 500, a touch softer, yields a little bit higher by two or three basis points, 399.37 on a 10-year, <coughs> and crude. Tom, let's sit on this. Crude is up by 4%. Almost $75 on WTI, back in the 80s on Brent crude. The breaking news overnight, the US and UK launching more than 60 airstrikes on Houthi targets in Yemen. 
Uh, not a lift uh, or, or uh, up, but up two standard deviations on Brent crude, eighty dollars thirty cents. John, I would eyeball eighty two, eighty three is where you get to see a measurement of tension on the global oil price. We're not there. Yet. We're trying to work out, Tom, if this is a one off or whether we're going to see more of this still to come. The communication we're getting from yeah. leaders from the U.S., from the U.K., may be suggesting that they might not have to do this again, but not ruling it out. Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister, describing the hits on Yemen, Tom, as limited, necessary, and proportionate. Yeah, I would say it's 50-50 right now. And the zeitgeist is, is, just, is just very apparent. This was an allied effort with Bahrain as well. And then the then what is another tactical strike and that's just, obviously, we're not going to hear about that before it. But you're right. There's a real indeterminate feel about this on a Friday morning. AMH with us around a table. Bloomberg Sambury to break this down for you <laughs> in about 15 minutes time. The calendar this week, so, so busy. A little bit later, in the next hour, we're going to hear from City. It's City's turn after you've already heard from JP Morgan, Bank of America and Wells. Then you get more data following CPI yesterday. PPI, 8.30 Eastern time. Mohamed Al Arian on this program reacting to these numbers immediately after they drop. And later on this morning, Tom Moore, Fed speak. Neil Kashgari of the Minneapolis Fed at 10 a.m. Eastern time. It's going to be interesting to see. And of course, there's the important BlackRock transaction as well. We'll have that at 9.30, I believe, this morning as well. But John, to your point with Dr. L. Arian, there's just so much to sum together after the exhausting, what is it, 12 days of January? I feel like, are we in late June? Like, it is like, January 12th. You know? It feels like the end of the first quarter, <laughs> yeah. but we're still getting through the earnings from the fourth quarter. That's just starting. Ken, Ken Leon, Leon, he's tanned and rusted. Joins us right now, Director of Equity Research at CFRA. Ken, you've had some time to pour over the numbers. Good morning to you, sir. What stands out for you? Well, I think uh, first on bank stock prices, they're really consolidating after a big move in the fourth quarter. And looking out to 2024, it's not going to be a V-shape, uh, if you will, strong recovery in any of the areas. But overall, what we're seeing is stability. And stability is going to lead to growth. Uh, loan growth, uh, net interest income just doesn't fall off the cliff when rates are cut, uh, mostly because it's the spreads, as was talked about earlier. And I think overall, it's the inflection point in investment banking. Uh, going into 2024, there is significant backlog, uh, particularly from the private equity firms, to monetize those investments into the market, uh, which would benefit the banks for investment banking for underwriting and M&A. Uh, additionally, banks are going to be conservative in their message with analysts today, uh, mostly because we expect to see tighter regulation by the end of this year. Uh, and you're going to hear the term both from banks and from analysts about capital build. That's going to be the clear message. And Ken Leon, Jane Frazier out later with 240,000 employees. I tried to add up the combined four bank employees and came up with over 900,000 employees between uh, the four. You've covered this for decades. Where's their employee account in five years? I mean, is this a shrinking business or do they just keep on, keep on going? Dave Fraser is doing a great job on a transformation, but for investors, transformation is a multi-year story with bumps. And I think for uh, what will be the headcount for a streamlined city group, as we look at it two to three years out, uh, is perhaps going to be 10 to 15 percent lower. There's a whole list of uh, businesses that are already announced as sold in consumer outside the U.S. Uh, so I think uh, what Jane Fraser is looking for is execution. And I think by pre-announcing, if you will, those one-time chargers, they want to show what that runway is of this transformation. What is that runway? What will we learn in the hour from Jane Fraser? I think uh, what Jane Fraser is going to articulate is that City has some very durable businesses that have very reliable recurring revenue, whether it's in corporate or treasury services and payments. And then when they look at the other businesses where maybe they had only one eye on the business, they're going to reinvest in wealth management along with selective areas of investment banking. But this is going to be a streamlined bank looking out two to three years. Uh, I would say, though, uh, there will be bumps along the way. We had that same narrative with Wells Fargo. They're in a better po position today than a few years ago. So I think for Jane Fraser, it's just sh really showing that the strategy is beginning to work. 
but it's not going to be a turnaround uh, just in 2024. Earnings from City in the next hour. Ken, I'm pleased to say it's going to break that down for us a little bit later. Ken, stay close. Ken Leon there of CFRA. With us around the table here in New York, Julian Emanuel, Chief Equity Strategist over at Evercore ISI. Good morning, Julian. Good morning. Numbers, numbers, tons of them. JP Morgan, Bank of America. Let's just go to the outlook. The guidance from JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon. Net interest income, 90 billion. The estimate, 86. Does anything else matter? Well, that's consistent with the, the outlook, his statement that rates could be higher for longer. And obviously, again, <laughs> Uh, the spread is is the part of it is the part of it that's it, it, most important, but it, I think when you step back and you think about where things are in general, whether it's the banks or the markets uh, in, in overall, is there's a lot of positivity priced in. And frankly, if you look at the last 24 hours, we had CPI come in hotter than expected. We had military action last night that has underpinned the price of oil significantly. And when you look at those. That's going to make the Fed's job much more difficult, five or six cuts. Are these durable trends? Are they durable? Uh, so, look, I think when you go back and you think about the rise in oil prior to October, there is uh, an element of uncertainty around all of this. And I think when, it, when you step away from it, it's the question of whether there is a greater degree of certainty priced in, whether the trends are or are not durable. But again, you run the fine line of potentially keeping <clears throat> inflation underpinned at a trajectory that's uncomfortable if policy, if psychology doesn't moderate a bit. I want to get to June and then try to get to December of this year. Your note is blistering and that we could go sub 4,000 SPX somewhere along the way. That's down 16 or 17 percent from here as well. That's called buying the dip. That's a hell of a dip. It's almost on the edge of bear market. Are you and Ed Hyman modeling a bear market equity market negative 18 percent? So actually, you know, Ed is calling for very mild recession at mid-year, consistent with the cumulative <clears throat> tightening that we've seen over the last couple of years and mindful of the fact that when you go back in modern financial history, there's only been one quote unquote soft landing. And part of our concern right now is that unlike this time last year, when everyone thought recession was imminent, mm -hmm. no one thinks uh, recession is imminent. And when you think about that kind of drawdown, the average non-recession year drawdown is 13 percent. So what we're really calling for is something not terribly out of the ordinary, but more consistent with volatility that you see in an average year. And 2023 right. was not an average year. Then where do you hide? Uh, we like defensive names. There is a very well-known history of consumer staples, of health care, of communication services working during the time between the last Fed hike <laughs> and the first cut, which in our view comes in the spring. What you're getting into is in your note, and I enjoyed your note in the last week, by the way, it's fantastic. The nothing can go wrong optimism, the sort of gripped markets, equities and bonds alike at the back end of last year, what's gonna shake it? What's the number one thing you can point to right now that shakes that up? I, I think it, it, there really isn't necessarily number one, but what I would say in the immediate term is the earnings trajectory. Uh, there is an expectation for year-on-year -year growth of 11.5%. <clears throat> now, normally, that would be fine, and there would be an expectation that that would come down, as it right. typically does. But the <clears throat> over-optimism is to the point where there is almost a believability factor that that number is right. sustainable. We think this season will sort of dash those hopes. So you're over at ISI with Enheim, and he's got the black you know, pen in his hand. He's trying not to get it in your shirt. He's all fired up. <laughs> he's calling mild recession. You're giving me a sub-4,000 SPX on the way to Nirvana. What I want to know is what do I do with the Magnificent Seven? Because I believe if interest rates come down in an Ed Hyman kind of way, those magnificent seven growthy companies are more valuable. Do I have that right? So you, you do, because basically <clears throat> the other part of the call, and Ed has been on this for well over a year, is that inflation has been and will continue to fall perhaps faster despite this bump in the road 
that we have. However, the last <coughs> mile towards that 2% will require the growth slowdown. In that environment, you don't sell secular yeah. winners. You hold them and you just are comfortable with the volume. I'm going to tear up here because we're having a C.J. Lawrence moment here. So Ed Hyman's at C.J. Lawrence, a guy named Yardeni takes over. Yardeni publishes last night, and he's with Ed Hyman on this. He's saying, you take a shelter, and we have disinflation right now. That's what you guys see, which tells me load the boat on Microsoft and the rest of them. Uh, I, again, it comes down to where perception and expectations are. And if we had had this conversation six weeks ago, prior to the Fed's pivot, we would say, okay, un understood, but expectations have gotten ahead of where the data potentially can go in the near to medium term. You mentioned the cumulative tightening earlier on in this segment. What hasn't hit that you think is going to hit after the Federal Reserve's hiked rates to 5.5%? Well, so you saw a softer ISM. Uh, essentially, the labor market at some point, in our view, is going to have not necessarily, you know, an incredible drop off, but a more normalized uh, progression uh, given this concept of global slowdown, which we think ultimately results in a slower U.S. Julian, this was awesome. It's good to see you. Julian Emanuel there of Evercore and what can shake the nothing can go wrong optimism, Tom, that we ended last year with. Well, you know, nothing can go wrong optimism. I mean, Julie is re Julian's really away. What I would look at here, John, is the belief, is disinflation good for the markets or not? And that goes to the growth call. And then, you know, you hear me talk about nominal uh, GDP. I mean, Ed Hyman's framing out a nominal GDP sub 4%. That changes the dialogue dramatically. Julian, just quickly, where's the unemployment rate at the end of the year? What, what are we thinking? Good. Four, five? Uh, Ed's view is you could nudge towards 5%. Okay. Wow. Getting closer to five, Tom. That shakes <clears throat> things up politically as well, yes. by the way. You know? Well, the overlay, yeah, absolutely. The overlay in the elections there. But this is a really important dialogue against everybody looking to the moon five. I mean, Yardeni's very optimistic on the equity markets. I mean, you know, that'd be great. Get Ed Hyman and Ed Yardeni together. We could do that. Julian, too. It'd be good. He's so nice. Yeah, we'll thank I mean, him yeah, twice. Sure. Julian, thank you. <laughs> Coming up later on this hour, <clears throat> in the next hour, at about 8 o'clock, earnings from City. 30 minutes after that, so 8.30 Eastern time, we'll get PPI and we'll get reaction from this guy right here, Mohammed al Arian of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College, Cambridge, from New York City. AMH, up next. The 2024 nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. The Islamic Republic of Iran Navy unlawfully seized the Marshall Islands flagged oil tanker St. Nicholas while the vessel was transiting the international waterways of the Gulf of Oman. It's another example of Iranian malign activity threatening security and stability in the region and we call on Iran to uh, release the, the tanker and the crew immediately. That was Pentagon spokesperson and Major General Pat Ryder addressing the latest Iranian attempts at disruption in the Middle East as the U.S. and its allies launch airstrikes in Yemen in response to attacks from Houthi militants in the Red Sea. From New York City this morning, good morning. Busy one already today going into the weekend. It's a busy Friday. Let's get straight to the bank earnings. This is from J.P. Morgan in the last 30 minutes or so. The stock turns higher by more than 2 percent, a little bit lighter than expected, Tom, in the investment banking revenue side uh -oh. of things. But the outlook, forget the numbers, get to the outlook. Record net interest yeah. income and predicting more of the same this year. They're going to apologize for the profits and try to hide how successful they are. What's important for those of you on radio, John's got the screen up and it's green on JP Morgan and everybody else is red. And what matters within Big Bank America is a 410 basis point spread between J.P. Morgan and Bank of America this morning. That's what needs to be said. Here's the outlook from J.P. Morgan 2024. Net interest income, $90 billion, the estimate, 86. <clears throat> 
90 against an estimate of 86. Their stock is higher. Let's turn to the broader story in markets at the moment. Equity futures are a little bit softer, down by 0.3%. Crude is a little bit higher by 3.5%. 74.50 on WTI. On Brent crude, back in the 80s briefly, 79.96 right now tk a lift to crude we got a real yield 180 down to 172 and back up to 175 so that's the churn this morning uh we should remember that in an hour and 15 minutes i believe we get some more inflation another snapshot of inflation in america ppi following cpi yesterday let's get to it right now and of course we must address the bottom end of the persian gulf amory horton joins us right now bloomberg washington uh, correspondent will there be another attack that seems to be the mystery out there within the british press the american press this allied tactical effort is there just an assumption there's more to do potentially this is what the president said last night that they want to send a clear message that the u.s and its partners notably the united kingdom that they will not tolerate attacks on personnel or allow hostile actors <clears throat> to imperil freedom of navigation in one of the world's most critical commercial routes so if the houthis were to respond and they do not knock it off to be frank in the red sea or the strait that leads from the right. india ocean to the red sea then we could potentially see more escalation what the u.s went after last night was I believe what Norman Rule said in the last hour was a degrading of capability. Is it going to be enough to deter what the Houthis are doing? The Houthis already came out and said that now they are going right. to respond. But then what happens after that response? Will there be a potential back channel, as in some of my reporting there have been in the past? Uh, an open question because of your work in the various and sundry stands, including Amory Horton in Afghanistan. The relationship between Tehran and the Houthis. You've got a special understanding of that. Is it a special relationship? Well, it is. The Houthis are another Iran backed proxy group. The same way, the same way the United States and Israel is dealing with Lebanese Hezbollah and dealing with Hamas. One source said to me last night, though, the Houthis cannot be undeterred. You've seen what the Saudis have been this barrage they have been to try to dislodge the Houthis from Yemen for years. This is why this is so delicate at the moment. There's this potential tentative peace agreement that no one really wanted to upend. But now this is the first time the U.S. is really taking this strike in Yemen because the attacks have gone too far on commercial vessels, which are now having to go around Africa. And this is upending the global economy. What potentially we could see, though, and what we saw after Trump and this is, this is an attack on the Houthis, not, not the Iranians. But will it be enough at some point for the Houthis then to send a message to the U.S. that we're done and we're happy to let ships go through? Well, let's go back to what happened last time around. You alluded to it. When Qasem Soleimani, the senior member of the Iranian military, was taken out in early 2020, there was a worry that would lead to escalation. It didn't. What happened? There was initial retaliatory strikes in Iraq from the Iranians because the Iranians felt that they had no choice. They have to show the world we are going to respond when you go after one of our generals. But I have sources that are familiar with this situation that have told me, which really is in public, that Iranians, including Javed Zarif, the former foreign minister, through the Swiss and other interlockers, one even calling it even a frenetic situation, they wanted to get the message across to the U.S., we are done because we don't want to see an escalation of this. Do you get the sense based on what you've heard that the Houthis are done after what's taken place? Because if we look at the language that we're hearing from the Houthi rebels this morning, all US, UK interests are now legitimate targets. Not at this moment, because at the moment what the US did was try to reduce their capabil capability of striking missiles. They didn't go after right. leadership. So what the US and British forces hit were 16 sites airports, radar installations, storage and launch sites for drones and missiles. No leadership was taken out here. But this is on top of U.S. This is consistent with what U.S. policy does. This is the first of potentially what could be an escalatory right. cycle and ladder. And I'd say just Admiral Stavridis has, has talked this up for Bloomberg Opinion here a number of weeks ago. You said Iran has some form of message within your reporting that they're quote unquote done. They're not done on the Lebanese border. They're not done in Gaza, and now they're not done somewhere down in Yemen out into the Red Sea. They don't, they look, they look, they don't look done. They were done, what I was referring to was 2020. The message they sent to the Trump administration after the killing and strike of Qasem Soleimani was, we're done. There were some retaliatory strikes in Iraq, and then that was it. But we are in a whole new world with also a different U.S. administration and also a different regime in Iran. There's a country we haven't mentioned and leadership we haven't talked about, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. How do they respond to this? 
Well, the message the Saudis have put out last night and this morning was that they are taking a close eye and monitoring the situation that is happening in the region. They weren't, obviously, the United States would have told the Saudis that this is about to happen. Uh, this is, they, they have a border with Yemen, but the Saudis have been trying to dislodge the Houthis for years, and they have this delicate truce at the moment. So it's easier for them politically, I think, to sit back, let the U.S. handle this, and watch it unfold. Was there any reporting that you had of how we affected this tactical exercise with a very ill Secretary of Defense? Was, was there any delicacy here, or was this event just oh, this event overcame all of that Washington introspection? This event, for the most part, overcame all of that. I'm sure there's lots of there are still lots of questions about this, but Secretary Lloyd Austin, from what we know, is set up to work at Walter Reed. Okay. And he also put out a statement last night. There's oh, okay. no, <laughs> so there's clearly no doubt in my mind that he was not aware, didn't give the go-ahead for this strike. There's also reporting that before he went into the hospital for um, for his procedure, he had given the okay on, on a previous strike as well in the Middle East. But there's going to be lots of questions because now the U.S. is becoming more embroiled in the Middle East, which this administration had said the Middle East has been the most quiet it's been in decades. That is no longer true. So there's going to be lots of questions about who is taking the lead here. This is an example of the United States working with the U.K., with Europe and others. President Lagarde of the ECB to <clears throat> French News yesterday, Tom, with this to say on the future and the prospect of a President Donald Trump. We should learn the lessons from history, from the way he let the first four years of his mandate. It is clearly a threat. It's sufficient to look at the trade tariffs, the commitment to NATO, the fight against climate change in just these three areas. In the past, U.S. interests were not aligned with European ones. Now, we can get into how astounding it was to hear from a central banker weighing on U.S. politics like banker, that. Yeah. But let's just sit on the content. What do you make of that? I, I make of it that all of this is timed, and I urge you, if you see her on the promenade, uh, waltzing down. You think she's going to want to sit down and have that conversation and with say, me? Tom asked me to ask you. And then, yeah. you know, we'll see if that works. Yeah, mate, stunning yesterday just to see those comments from Lagarde. Well, it's very political, and I'm not sure if people go to central bankers to be political. Can you imagine Jay Powell at the Fed weighing in on Emmanuel Macron or Rishi Sunak Shocking. and their future? Shocking. We'll talk more about it in just a moment. <laughs> Absolutely stunning to see those comments yesterday. MH, it's good to see you. <clears throat> Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative a quarter of 1%. Coming up next on the bond market, Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo. Looking ahead to PPI data a little bit later this morning. That's at 8.30 at 8 o'clock. Numbers from City. Ken Leon of CFRA. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, 60 minutes away from PPI data, that's just around the corner, about 30 minutes away from earnings from Citigroup. Going into all of that, equity futures negative on the S&P 500 by let's call it a third of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down about a third of 1%. Also, we were lower on JP Morgan, then we were higher off the back of better guidance from JP Diamonds Bank. Net interest income, about $90 billion, the estimate 86.0%. Eight. So JP Morgan better in the pre-market off the back of that. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year shaping up as follows. A two-year yield higher by a basis point or two. 426.38 higher by three on a 10-year, 399.56. Got to sit on this, Tom. Crude, back in the 80s, briefly on Brent crude. And we're back again, up by 3.7%. WTI up by 3.9%. Let's call it 75 Let's call it a lift. And I've said this a number of times. I do say, think we've got to stay on the story as we get more news out of Washington and London on what is next. But the answer is up $2.85 on uh, Brent crude. I need to see 82 83 before uh, it has my full attention. I would want to know, John, on a Friday here, with all the data that we've got, I, I would call it a churning in the yield space. There's a value here to watch yields into the Friday close. Agreed. And into the data a little bit later on this morning. That's the price action. Let's sit on the top stories. Under surveillance this morning, Houthi rebels in Yemen vowing to continue targeting commercial vessels in the Red Sea after a U.S.-led coalition launched over 60 airstrikes against the group. President Biden saying in a statement, quote, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and the free flow of international commerce as necessary. 
necessary. Tom, not ruling out more strikes. Yeah, absolutely. And what's important there is the people. We, there was an attack. I mean, I'm in the camp, John, that if there's 18 drones in the air and you do a victory lap because you shot them out of the air, that's great. But that's an attack because there's this humbling reality. One of 18 could have got through. Three of 18 could have got through. So I think the president's language there is appropriate. The mere presence wasn't a deterrent. We kept seeing those attacks. And you wonder yeah. if the strikes overnight, Tom, will be. <clears throat> Your second story, the bank earnings. So busy the last hour, wasn't it? Bank of America, JP Morgan. Shinali <laughs> saved us. <laughs> Shinali often does. JP Morgan up by 1.81% in the pre market. Tom, um, <clears throat> forget the numbers. Let's just talk about the outlook. Well, the outlook's there, and I think you see it with the red and the green. You know, we've got a green on JP Morgan, no shock there, and red going the other way with everybody else. Yes, Citigroup's going to give us a Jane Frazier restructuring. I guess that's what it is. I want to know the outlook in restructuring out 12 months, out 24 months. What's the new banking look like? And I think there was an illusion there from Kim Leon and George Cassidy that <laughs> they're going to cut and they're going to add back in places they need to add back in. But still, 989,000 employees is going to come down a little bit over the next year or two. Uh, haven't we seen that as an example with BlackRock? <clears throat> we saw the staff cuts earlier in the week. And then we see the big the acquisition yeah. later on in the week exactly. as well, a $12.5 billion dollar acquisition. Th this is really important what John brings up here, folks, because BlackRock is not only the, what was it, 5% cut now. There was a cut earlier in the year. So, you, you know, you add them up as you go. It's a 7, 8, 9% restructuring in BlackRock. That's a lot of people. I can't get you to the end of the year, Tom. I'll get you through the next four days. The next 30 minutes, numbers from City. Then early next week, you'll hear from Morgan Stanley. You'll hear from Goldman Sachs as well. I wanted to save some time for this story. I want your thoughts on this, TK. Right. Christine Lagarde, the ECB president, <clears throat> with her most vocal comments on US politics to date, warning that another Donald Trump presidential term is, quote, clearly a threat, saying trade tariffs, the commitment to NATO, the fight against climate change in just these three areas, US interests were not aligned with the European ones. She and her, has really caught my attention. She and her team would tell me this was taken out of context, et cetera, et cetera. Baloney. This is a central banker talking about politics. Now, the former trade minister of France, with all of her work at the IMF, sure, certainly she can weigh in on politics, except she's got a new job as central banker. And I think everybody, including you and Mike Schumacher and others coming up, would say, Jesus seems a little bit inappropriate. What's more important uh, to me is the unexpected that can come out, including the election in the United States, and then what for the European Central Bank, the institution? So, Tom, you've got the comments, then you've got the person delivering <clears throat> them. I think we all agree. Highly unusual for a central banker to speak Hi, yes, this way. Yes, absolutely. Let's put that to one side and just focus on the content. On the, Kent, on the content, <clears throat> she is absolutely right. It's a statement of fact. However, this works both ways. Let's reframe it. How aligned have European interests been with America's over the last decade? Was a huge energy relationship <clears throat> with Russia in America's interest? Was a questionable stance on China in America's interest? Was under-resourcing well, defense on the continent falling short of what was promised towards NATO, Tom? Was that in the interests of America? The former president has a lot of faults, without a doubt. Discussing it is an industry and has been an industry ever since he was elected back in 2016. But Europe has been running an unsustainable contradictory approach to policy across key dimensions now for a decade plus. And arguably, if anything, over the last two years, you've seen real cracks in that, Tom, particularly given what's happened in Ukraine over the last couple of years. Well, certainly the energy uh, dynamic and the challenge for Lagarde being a much, much weaker, uh, call it Germany or even a larger space, a Germanic exper experiment. But what's important here, John, is that this tension is here amid disinflation and debt expansion. And debt expansion is taken completely different within her fractious ECB than it is in America. I, do you hear anybody in Congress talking about the expansion of debt in the United States? Very rare, very few people. In Europe, it's a third rail she has to deal with. Particularly in Germany. Yeah, Particularly absolute in third rail. Uh, that's the latest this morning. <clears throat> Just stunning to see some of those comments, Tom, overnight. We're going to keep you through this Friday, entertain with good conversation. We start with Mark Schumacher, Global Head of Macro Strategy at Wells Fargo. If you're part of MIT Sloan, you got your dose of the wonderful Robert Solo in growth economics. Let's start there, Mike Sh uh, uh, Schumacher, with Solo 101. What does the growth trajectory of America look like into this year? 
Not all that great, Tom. And we get this question all the time. Is the U.S. going to have a recession, yes or no? But the big takeaway is it's not a binary thing. And if you listen to Jay Bryson, he'll say the chance of a severe recession is very low. And I think that's the big point for clients, that if growth is right around zero, maybe it tips negative for a bit, it's not the end of the world. But the idea of getting a 2 3 4% shrinkage, the chance of that seems very, very low. So to me, that's the main point. How do you asset allocate into your macro strategy? Are you making big adjustments or is it steady as she goes? Right now, steady. A wise man told me recently the markets are in a sort of choppy mode, probably stay that way for a while. I think that's right, especially for the next few weeks. John Farrell, perhaps, and also Jeff Shore on our FX desk. So John's got plenty of company there. But when you think about the data flow for the next couple of weeks, it's pretty light, frankly. So why take a big swing right now? I think people are looking to the Fed, looking to the central banks, waiting to the end of the month and probably reassess at that point. But for now, it's been pretty thin as far as activity. And let's turn to Jamie Dimon, who put out some comments with earnings this morning, Mike, who talked about the economy could see stickier inflation for longer than expected. Rates could be high for longer than expected and said this on government spending as well. The economy has been fueled by large amounts of government deficit spending. Mike, those tailwinds that have supported growth and arguably fueled inflation in some places. Are you expecting that to continue for much longer? We're not expecting the fiscal, call it impulse, John, to continue for much longer. But a big risk, I think, for markets, and a lot of my colleagues would agree, is that inflation effectively gets stuck. So it's come down a lot in many countries. A lot of people hope, and maybe that's not a great strategy, but hope it comes down further. We think it probably will, but there's at least a chance you get core inflation in the U.S. that sits in the high twos. And in Europe, it doesn't approach 2%. And then what? What do you do if you're a central banker? We don't know. They probably wait and watch for a good six months and then say, ah, do we really have to come in and hike again? We don't want to do that, but we can't really come in at ease. So that's a risk out there for the markets. I'd say the chance of that's probably a 10, maybe 20% chance, but it's certainly material. People have to think about it. How do you study the cash conundrum that we have, trillions of dollars that have wandered out to 5.x percent money market fund. A lot of good work being done on this, Mike Schumacher. But what's a summary of what our, our listeners and viewers should think about trillions potentially exiting money market funds? Yeah, it's a question, Tom, of how much actually can move. Certainly money market funds can lose a lot of the assets they have currently, and it's been a very attractive spot for a lot of people. 5% plus sounds great, right? So yeah. for the first time in a generation, cash has actually been viable. So we do think some of that cash is going to exit, but it's going to be a fairly methodical process. I think people tend to chase return. There's no mystery in that. But when you look at the S&P performance last year and then try to use that as a template for this year, I suspect most people are wondering about that. So we think the process yeah. is going to be fairly slow. It gets a push when the Fed eventually cuts, because then you can say, whoa, I may not get that 5% much longer. I should lock in something better. Is the Fed behind? I mean, that's the heart of the matter here. I mean, I was making a joke about a January rate cut. People took me seriously. But, but Mike Schumacher, is the bottom line as an ex-post institution that they're behind right now? I'm not sure the Fed's behind, but I think the big thing, Tom, here is that you just can't tell if you're a central banker. No one has seen this environment before. Not me, not you, not Jay Powell, not Madame Lagarde. The environment's been so crazy in terms of COVID, incredible inflation, now a rapid drop in inflation. It seems to me it's a bit foolish to think the exit's going to be smooth. We expect a lot of bumps. So the Fed's confidence interval has to be really wide right now. I can't tell. So, Mike, as you know, the markets are six cuts, the Federal Reserve is implying three, and I say implying three, it's based on the median dot, which, as you know, means a lot of things to different people. Mike, I just wonder from your perspective, looking back at history, how likely is it that you go one or the other once you start cutting interest rates? Yeah, the history is really compelling, John. We've done a bunch of work on this. My colleagues on the FX side have done really a great job. And when you look at cycles by whether it's the Fed, the ECB, BOE, take your pick. When a big central bank starts to cut, it cuts a lot. So 200 basis points plus in the first year, that's very common. And now we've got a fairly high rate environment. It might be more than that. So it seems to us that when the Fed does launch that first move, let's say it's middle of this year, 
The markets at that point should price at least 200 basis points of cuts over the next year. Right now, they're priced for about 130, 140, too light. So the idea that the Fed goes a little bit doesn't make a lot of sense. So, Mike, where does that leave your projections for year end based on what you just said? Yeah, we're modestly bullish, John. So we've had a pretty wild run, I suppose most people have, in terms of being bullish too early. It's been kind of okay the last month or so. But as far as year end, 10 year Treasury, call it 350, pretty wide band around that. I think a decent amount of the work gets done by March, so maybe 375 over the next quarter. So a fairly modest drop. But again, like the Fed, like the policymakers, I think you have to be humble and say lots of factors can intrude on that forecast. So that's our base case, but lots of risks around it. It's a forecast. So modestly bullish. With a very large caveat and a big asterisk. Mike Schumacher, thank you, sir. Appreciate the update. Mike <laughs> Schumacher of Wells Fargo. It's so difficult to forecast this market, TK, right. even a quarter out. 375, well, by the way, the call from Wells. That was brilliant in its boredom. I loved what he said about we're still within the thrall, including bankers, including Lagarde, of the pandemic. And I think that's been underplayed over the last number of weeks. But what I heard there, John, is what I'm going to call a single-digit conversation. Mike Schumacher saying, you know, there's all this... TV and radio inflammatory discussion, we, we believe, we believe. And what Mike Schumacher is saying is, you know what? Steady as she goes, and it's a time to garner single digit returns this year. That's what I really heard there. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. State of play, scores look like this on the S&P 500. Equity futures negative 0.2%. <clears throat> 0.24% lower on the S&P. Yields higher by three basis points or so to 399.75 and crude up by 3.6%, 3.5% at the moment, 74.53. Tom, you asked this question just moments ago. <coughs> so we've just got some comments from the Pentagon spokesperson. Yeah, they were listening. Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin actively engaged in overseeing and directing yeah. operations. Lloyd Austin gave the order to conduct yesterday's Red Sea strike. So the Defence Secretary, Tom, you wanted to know is he coordinating no. this? Is he active? Based on that information, he is. People think Amory Horton just shows up. It basically, she and you know, I'll give Shanali Basic the credit. The moment they step off set, they're glued to their phones, working their sources. And Amory Horton reported that the secretary was actively involved. That's the latest from Washington and the latest on the Middle East coming up later this morning, 8.30 Eastern Time. PPI data drops, Mohammed Al Aryan response of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College Cambridge. That conversation in the next hour. Right now, the NFL uh, Sunday ticket is a uh, is a big area of focus for us. And again, as I said, getting that viewer experience right, um, making that game day experience on Sunday flawless and seamless. And you should expect from us a lot more innovation there in terms of products, in terms of creator integrations, all the things that our fans, especially younger fans of the NFL on YouTube expect. You should see more of that through the season and in the many seasons to come. The fans are tuning in. That was the YouTube CEO speaking back in October. Since then, the NFL reporting its best rating since 2010. 93 of the top 100 TV broadcasts last year, NFL games. And it's not just YouTube. Peacock getting involved this weekend, set to broadcast their first playoff game, the NFL signaling a shift away from linear TV. Michael Nathanson and Moffat Nathanson weighing in, writing, quote, where the history of linear TV has been written, a sad and sorry chapter will be dedicated to how such a once great business was supplanted by a model that wasn't nearly as good for anyone. Michael, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Michael, great to catch up with you, sir. Let's discuss it. Let's talk about the sport itself, the dominance of football in this country. What's everyone else getting wrong? American football. Yeah, American football. Whatever, whatever, whatever's getting wrong, it, it's a perfect sport for a TV, right? You have you know, a set of games, very predictable every week. It's a short season. Every game matters. And sports gambling is is growing very quickly so it's a combination of it's it's easy to watch you can bet on it and we have national storylines right the teams are now nationally right. followed in a way that when tom and i were younger that wasn't the case it was a regional sport but now it's national in terms of fandom mike i was watching digiday reading digiday i should say about the complete total dominance of mr moan's youtube 
and I'm absolutely fed. You've been so far out front on this with Craig Moffitt. Is anybody down the road going to compete with the two consolidated giants, YouTube and Netflix? Amazon. So it's interesting. You know, people have always said content is king. I think the past decade, what, it's, what's, what we see now is the platform is king. And I put Amazon, Netflix, and YouTube as the future leaders in this industry, right. current leaders in the future. And the challenge for media companies is how do you play in that world, right? How does your content resonate in a world where you have these massive platforms with so much choice? And this is this is the challenge the next next decade. Michael, we got to make some news here, so let's get to it. It's a Friday. We need okay. Nathanson news right now. Paul Sweeney modeled out yesterday uh, the idea of ESPN with a 40 percent lift, I believe, in expense. They have to pay for all this uh, sporting activity. Is Mr. Iger setting up ESPN for an immediate sale to Amazon? You know, he has floated the idea of finding minority partners. I don't think he wants to give it up at this point in time. Um, he's floated partners from the platforms, from the leagues, maybe some other third parties. I think Disney wants to be in the sports business, and they just want to find some funding to help them get through. We have wondered for a while now how ESPN is a better business going forward than it's been. Costs are rising. Yeah. Court cutting continues to slide. <laughs> So we've been writing lately, and we'll start with this a couple of weeks ago, Tom, with you, is that we think streaming, and they've not had a good streaming run here, but they need to focus more energy on streaming and less on ESPN. And we'll see if they listen I mean, to us. This, but, John, but, you know. this to me is like the interview of the year, John. It was Daniel Levy and you in <laughs> London. Yeah. And at the end of that interview, I was standing there, folks, off the side having a, a pre-cocktail tang. And the answer is, John, is he said, well, we, just, we don't really want to win. We just sort of want to compete and have a good Entertain. entertainment. I'm not hearing that from Nathanson or Iger. It's totally different over here about winning. Let's talk about the sport. Michael, yep. how do you break it? I think you break it by airing playoff games on streaming platforms that people don't have. I asked my producer, Jamie, this morning. Simple question. Do you have a producer? Jamie. I don't Jamie's have fantastic. One. How come you have you don't one? get to I share it. I turned to Jamie, Michael, and I said, How do you watch the football? When's it on? And he gave me an answer immediately. I said, How do you watch the baseball? When's it on? Couldn't answer the question. He's a basketball fan. I said, When's the basketball on? How do you watch it? Couldn't answer the question with a direct answer. That's the problem for all these other sports. And a great example of that is boxing. They have killed boxing. This used to be something everyone used to watch together. It's not anymore. It's buried on a streaming platform, whatever it's called. I don't know. I like boxing and I don't pay to watch it. Michael, are they about to break it? You talked about the loss of the experience and I'm with you. They're killing it. They've got success. Are they about to break it? Yeah, John, I'll break news on the air with you. I totally agree with you. It makes me so angry as a consumer and an analyst that the, this is one of, this playoff game is probably the top game of the weekend, right? And when I got the, when I saw the schedule when, when it came out, I'm like, wait, they're putting they're putting the Dolphins Chiefs on Peacock, so we have to pay six bucks more a month to get it for one night. That's just in, outrageous to me, right? It just is, and I I think it's greedy, and yeah, you know, I know why Comcast is doing it and Peacock. I think the league is is overreaching here, and they've done an amazing job navigating the entire fragmentation of media. But I think you're right, John. I think there's a, a feedback loop which says, these guys don't care about the fans. They're in it for the money. And it's just loud and clear by having the best game of the weekend on Peacock. And I totally agree with you. Michael, is this because the angry. numbers simply don't work? I've heard TV executives talk about this. The problem with sport is that you build out the asset, but you never own it. You have to lease it. You get a four or five year deal. I just wonder whether the numbers really work anymore. It was always about grabbing that appointment of view. There were very few left. Let's go to sports. Live TV, all that's left is sports and this right here, broadcast news. Michael, I just wonder the future of that, given how much the asset now costs. Well, it was interesting, John. Um, when you're 90 to 100 million homes in America, it was a great model. But as homes start to slide, the cost of sport keeps going up and the cost of rev and the revenues keep coming down or flattening. So it doesn't work for every sport. The NFL yeah. is key because for five months out of a year, it maintains the pay TV bundle. That is the different sport, right? right? Hockey, as much as I love hockey, is small. Baseball's become you know a small sport in America, but the NFL and college football are different. 
I think those two models hold right. for the time being, for the time being, right? They hold. Michael, you and Craig Moffat on the high ground on predicting that we would cut the cord. I'm going to give credit also to your good competitor, Rich Greenfield, for being out front on this as well. I want to talk about the new cord cutting, which is the churn. Model a 6% churn and what that means for finance of our entertainment. To me, that's a ginormous number because I think over 36 months of business plan that you lose 18% of your people. Am I right? Well, yeah, the, you know, Tom, the churn is actually 6% a month for some of these services. So think about that, right? So in, you know, over a couple of years, let's say a year and a half, you can churn your entire base out. The streaming model does not work as built today. That's where you're seeing all these bundles come together because, as Craig, and Craig, Craig's been on this from day one, there was nothing better, I mean, 20 years ago, there was nothing better than the PTV bundle because you don't have to compete uh, for customers. The customer is given to you by the cable operator. You just had to make one good show a quarter to get paid by the cable operator. In this world, you need a constant, constant hit cycle, and it's impossible to do. So it churns off the charts. The model, you know, Netflix has surprised me. We've been a bit of a doubter on Netflix's model, but it's just worked their way so well. The number two position is not very pretty. If you look at Disney in terms of the economics, they lost two and a half billion dollars right. last year. You need to cut churn, and the only way you cut churn right. is by bundling with other people or seeing competitors now, die. That's that's where we are. I know your single best buy is the New York Yankees with Juan Soto. What a gift that is! <laughs> but in the finance, in the stock market, Michael Nathanson, what's your single best buy right now? Well, it's funny. Our single best buy is actually a short call on Roku. So, like you know, we've been push. We've been very very aggressive on Meta and Alphabet the past fifteen months. So we still like them, but it's getting harder and harder to see the, you know, it was a home run a year ago. We were saying that. In media, we've been buying Disney, but for Disney, I feel like the pressure's on them to now prove prove the case for streaming, right? So so our best call is shorting Roku here, which is, you know, a, a call on the state of streaming, right? That's, that's our, the call of the year. We do this every six months. We update our call. Today, for me, it's Roku on the, on the sell side. Love this. Michael, let's do this again soon. Michael Nathanson okay. there of Muffet Nathanson. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, TK, when this all started, it was meant to benefit I, the consumer. And you have conversations like that. You just get the feeling people are increasingly frustrated with the direction of travel. Two here. of the gifts I've had, folks, over the last couple of years is young Pharaoh saying to me, hey, stupid, follow Formula One. And the other one was following the tots. They just brought a Romanian. They sent the, the football, the fullback who couldn't do it to Did Germany you send the scouting review? to see Kane. <laughs> you interviewed Daniel Levy, and guess what? Nobody's whining. They go out, they play. Yeah. They go, the clock moves, and it's over, and you go home, unlike the NFL forever. The, the Chiefs thing this weekend is absurd. Agreed. If you want to kill a sport, hide it on a streaming platform. Yeah. We feel pretty good about the year ahead. We're looking for broadening. The trend is in the right direction, and that's the key for the market. We don't need to run the risk of tipping the economy over. It's hard to say the market really reflects that anxiety. The economy is actually doing great. It seems like the whole soft landing is happening. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance from New York, and it is a day of big bank earnings. We've seen that out in the compare and contrast. As Shanali Basak nailed, J.P. Morgan, 1.72 is their book value. Citigroup, last in line, 0.52. John Farrell picks up the pieces from Jane Fraser. She's got a wall to climb. As she does, and the stock has been rallying in anticipation of a year ahead and a new strategy. We are higher by more than 30% since October. The stock is lower this morning by 2% with the numbers. Here's Shanali Basak. Hey, Shanali. Very simply, John, we're looking at that fourth quarter revenue line, the very top line. We're looking at the miss on expectations. Investors expected them to bring in $18.7 billion. They brought in 
2.4. So that is the top line number there. Uh, we are making it through the numbers here, but even returns on equity as well. You're looking at the fourth quarter come in just a little above expectations, or sorry, below expectations. They're negative. I'm sorry, in the fourth quarter. Uh, they were expected to be positive. So again, this was a kitchen sink quarter. Investors had known that about Citigroup. So what we're going to see for the next couple of hours is a few things. What are all of the toss, costs tied to restructuring? Uh, we already know there were costs tied to uh, extraneous items in different parts of the world, parts that are largely exiting. This is Jane Fraser's year. This is the year she has to bring the turnaround story to Wall Street. And remember, wow. we have to see what that is in terms of um, those markets and investment banking businesses, in particular core Wall Street. The fourth quarter was very disappointing. Not my words, the words of Jane Fraser, the city CEO. The fourth quarter was very disappointing. Revenue coming in at 17.44 billion, the estimate 18.68. Schnally, as you know, investors won't pay as much attention to this because these are yesterday's results. We want tomorrow's off the back of the changes they've made. What kind of changes have been made in the last 12 months and how quickly will we see the results of them? Project Bora Bora. This is the project that they have that is eliminating layers and layers of management. Jane Fraser, we know, inherited a bank that was bloated, that had regulatory issues, and that had many layers of bureaucracy that she is now taking an absolute axe to. Investors have largely rewarded her moves to do that, though it'll take a minute to get through all those layers of management. Now, again, that is the fixing story, but where does she get competitive in those Wall Street businesses? And also, I'm looking at costs of credit as well. Remember, Remember, Citigroup's cost of credit rose to $3.5 billion in the fourth quarter. Right. It was $1.8 the year ago. I, I, to her great credit, she puts the ugly ratios up top. Return on common equity is single digit 5% versus 13, 14, 15% for more successful shops. Let me ask you this in six months or in six years is Citigroup still a big bank? Yes, but you know, even just this morning, I was taking a look at just how much J.P. Morgan has broken away from the pack. What is big anymore? I think in 10 years, you have to ask yourself, are these six banks as competitive with each other as they are today when you see the biggest of the big breaking away? Citigroup has won on being a big global bank. The most profitable and exciting, if you will, business they have is their treasury and trade solutions business, which really makes its money from global internationals. But as we've seen from the losses they've taken uh, tied to Argentina's currency fluctuations, uh, operations that were tied to Russia, again, largely businesses that they've exited, it's hard to be a big global bank. Shanali, stay close. More to come from Shanali Basso to wrap up these numbers. We'll give us some more time to go through the earnings release. Tom, Jane Fraser of City, not dressing it up, being quite blunt about it. Fourth quarter was very disappointing. The wealth business isn't where it needs to be. That's the tone from the City CEO this morning. The stock turns around just a little <coughs> bit in the pre-market, now higher TK by 2.3%. Absolutely fascinating. Let's dive into this. Ken Leon joining us with expertise 60 minutes ago and reappears with CFRA, their director of equity research. And he's familiar with a 10 to 1 reverse stock split in 2007 8, which is our Citigroup maybe uh, was repriced from 40 down to $4 per share. Ken Leon, let's just cut to the chase. Is Jane Frazier going too slowly? Jane Fraser has no choice. She has a monolithic bank that she's trying to streamline to be a very different bank in the future. And, and by doing that, I think the story that hasn't been told is that key talent is looking over their shoulder whether they have a job or not, or whether how much risk they should take, whether it be an investment banking or trading, their key talent. The strategy is going to work, but it's gonna take several years and I think to the prior discussion, uh, this will no longer be uh, a leading global bank, right. but one more akin to a custody bank like a Bank of New York Mellon. That's right where I wanted to go. Thank you so much, Ken Leon. And then it goes back to culture and character. My first checking account, John, was with Manny Hanny. And when you said manufacturers Hanover, that meant something. So what's Citigroup look like in five years? Is it BNY Mellon? Or is there a better analog out there that we can look to? I think clearly it's going to be where they have durable businesses with recurring fee income. Uh, that will be in treasury services. It will be in wealth and asset management. Uh, they will also try to play a role with catch up uh, with asset management and wealth. Uh, but it's really an enormous competition for Jane Fraser. 
And again, I think as we go through 2024, every quarter is not going to be in a linear fashion of improvement. Uh, there will be <clears throat> some issues that do come up. Um, they couldn't even <clears throat> sell Banamex uh, in Mexico. That will be an IPO in 2025. Uh, the analysts generally are very positive about Citi. Um, I still look back to Wells Fargo with Charlie Scharf, and, and that took five years to really get them to, to where they are today. Uh, so I think uh, it's the right strategy, but I think there's a bit of optimism of how well this will work quarter to quarter in 2024. Can you hit it? How big will the big bank be? This from City, seeing a net reduction in headcount of 20,000 over the medium term. Shanali, I'm sure that's a number that jumped off the page for you as well. Is that what you were expecting? Uh, in line, yeah. I, I mean, we knew that it would be tens of thousands. It's nice to get an eight, uh, a headcount number here because they had been holding off on giving the full extent of what we would see here. It is in line with what we were expecting. Now, uh, how much it's going to cost them is something we'll look at as well. This was going to be, we call it kitchen sink quarter, right? I mean, we they had a lot of charges um, that they're going to have to announce and work through for those headcount reductions. If, if, you know, if you wouldn't believe it, they had the biggest, among the biggest of headcounts of the top two banks, I believe that they were even over Bank of America. So they had a lot of room to cut as painful as it is. Ken Leon, let's talk about what this could all mean for capital returns. The latest from City is we'll continue to evaluate buybacks quarter by quarter. Can you take us across the industry right now? Given everything we've been discussing, what do capital returns look like? Capital returns as it relates to from the operating part of the business is good. And, and we will see uh, overall, you know, 12, 14 percent returns. Uh, clearly, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase is well above that. But it's the risk of capital bill with tighter bank regulation. Capital bill means uh, that the banks, even on generating uh, strong returns, uh, will be mindful in terms of uh, higher capital requirements and the restraint it will have for dividend growth and buybacks. That's Basel III end game. It's going to be really a delicate dance for the large banks uh, not to really um, oversell how well they're doing because on the back end, uh, you know, regulators both in Europe and U.S., they're concerned about the black swan, whether it's Credit Suisse or other episodes in the past. Um, and that means some of the higher return areas, such as in the derivative trading, uh, the banks are going to take less risk and hold on to more oh, capital. Citigroup's, i got to make some news here, Ken. It's a slow Friday. Ken Leon... Is Citigroup so challenged that what we're looking at out 12 or 24 months is a merger of one of the super regionals with this big bank Citigroup that's not a big bank anymore, where they wake up the next day and almost like, you know, uh, a Swiss bank and U U UBS whatever years ago, all of a sudden the next day they're a big bank again. Is that where Jane Frazier's heading? I, I don't think it's with the regional banks because they, they have plenty of deposits and loans. I think it's the non-banking areas of, of services that really matters to them and fee income. And, and that's why I mentioned Bank of New York as one example uh, where they have durable businesses, but they don't get higher multiples, Tom. Um, you, you really are moving away from perhaps the higher return, higher growth areas but they know they have to get away from the cyclicality of being in, being a bank because you don't get rewarded. Ken, there's a few big names left for next week. It's Morgan Stanley, it's Goldman. Can you take anything from this morning and apply it to those names next week? What would you expect? I, I think um, 2024 is going to look good for investment banking. Uh, the numbers, though, will suggest that it won't be V-shaped. Uh, but I can assure you that there will be plenty of activity in equity and debt underwriting and M&A. Uh, the alts, you know, there's only about two analysts on the street that cover banks and the private equity firms. I'm one of them. There is enormous backlog to monetize these. And Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley will be there to help execute on that. The other story, which is for another day, is the shift of lightening up the balance sheet and loans uh, and moving over to private credit. Uh, so again, all the attention is on the large banks. But when you look at Blackstone, Apollo, Aries and others, uh, they're in a pretty good position. Hey, Ken, appreciate the update and the help this That's morning. Great. Ken Leon of CF 
All right. If you are just joining us, welcome to the programme. I'll give you the state of play on the banks first of all. JP Morgan positive in the pre-market by a little more than 2%. Their outlook for net interest income better than expected. City Tom turns around up by almost 3%. Yeah, Mike Mayo looking like a genius. 41 up to 53 on Citigroup. I guess that's the beginning of a move for this year. John, what I would emphasize there in all that tumult and that turmoil is, is Jane Frazier, the, the execution of this down Lexington Avenue. I'm fascinated by the immense pressure to buy, get going, get going, get going, and yet Ken Leon saying, hey, Tom, you're an amateur, it's not that easy. You mentioned Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo looking for that stock to maybe double Tom. Yeah. for the next few years, which is quite amazing. <coughs> City up by 2.75%. The broader market equity futures right here on the S&P 500, slightly negative, down by 0.27%. Yields are higher by three basis points, 4% on a 10-year. So much more still to come this morning. PPI data, 8.30 Eastern time. Reaction to it with Mohammed al Arian of Queen's College, Cambridge. A must-watch conversation in the back half of this hour. Charlie, before you go, you've had some time to pour over it. What's the big takeaway from this morning? Uh, the outlook. We've said that this was going to be a kitchen sink quarter for Citigroup, but she wants to grow the revenue by 2 to $3 billion, and she wants to shave off tens of thousands from her headcount. Medium term, she sees it being about 180000 which is remarkable. That could signal more job cuts ahead. This will be a much smaller bank, to Tom's point. And if you look throughout the mm -hmm. entire banking system, the margin at which J.P. Morgan is expanding over everyone else is remarkable. Right. They bought in $10 billion more net interest income than Bank of America alone. Quickly, last and, and, and this is what you're best at. The cultural shift from Sandy Weil, Travelers, Citigroup, over to what Ken Leon said is this is the next BNY Mellon. I, I can't frame that culturally in New York. The financial supermarket was Sandy Weil. Focus is Jane Fraser. That is the simplest way to put it. This will be a smaller bank with more defined business lines, with more accountability on every single person in that bank. Shanali, absolutely excellent as always. Shanali Basset, thank you. More from Shanali through this morning, <coughs> through the day, and into next week as well. Earnings still to come next week from Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. In your equity market, S&P 500 futures negative by a third of 1%. Crude, 74.30 on WTI up by 3%. Brent crude, briefly, in the 80s, 79.80 right now. Victoria Fernandez at Crossmark Global Investments up next from a beautiful New York City. Good morning. of rate cuts that are priced in in the near term, starting you know as early as, as in two months from now, uh, that may not come to fruition. I mean, the Fed is good at waiting and watching and, and lagging, right? They lagged on the way up and they are probably gonna wait too long and keep rates too high for too long uh, before they cut and then they're gonna have to cut uh, more aggressively. There was a real shift yesterday from Michael Collins, fixed income senior portfolio manager over at PGM. He's been constructive on credit for a while. He's not anymore. <clears throat> He's been reducing risk. And when we asked him why, is it about price or fundamentals, the story or the price of the story, he said the price of the story, <clears throat> TK, spread's just getting too tight over the last few months. I can't say enough about PGM across the Hudson River. They picked up uh, uh, Tom Purcelli as well uh, this year for economic wisdom. But... I thought that interview was great with Michael Collins about just grab the coupon and don't overthink. Now, where you are in duration and how far up, but that was a real clarion call of grab the coupon and don't overthink about your own power. That was CPI Thursday this morning. <clears throat> is Ancient history. CPI Friday. CPI data in about 13 minutes time, TK. <clears throat> Mohammed al Arian just around the corner. Right now we're going to get to it and we can dovetail in here the bank earnings that we've seen. We do this with Victoria Fernandez, Chief Market Strategist at Crossmark Global Investments. Victoria, I had a wonderful interview with Sandy Weil a long, long time ago. And he was reminiscing about the roll-up that became Citigroup, Travelers Insurance, and all that. And I want you to deal now with the Magnificent Seven of what happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago where somebody out there said, we should buy and hold Citigroup. And that didn't work out. How do you handle buy and hold if you know there's a next Citigroup out there? 
Yeah, I'm not sure I have the perfect playbook for that, Tom, but there are names that we have in our portfolio that they're going to have the volatility around them. Apple's a perfect example. Microsoft is a perfect mm -hmm. example when you talk about some of those Magnificent Seven that we do see as buy and hold in our portfolio. It doesn't mean you can't be a little bit tactical, right? We've talked before about how you trim names on up days. You can go in and add a little on down days. So you can have little tactical moves, but overall you want to hold some of those positions for longer periods of time for these companies. And they're, they've are they proven themselves over and over. Their balance sheets look good, their right. cash flows right. look good. So I think you're gonna have some of that and some of these Magnificent Seven names will be those names. What are you learning from your Crossmark accounts about cash? They must still be in cash at 5%, but are they ready to move if they see a lower yield? Yeah, it's interesting. We have seen some movement from cash. Um, when you look globally, it's moving into equity ETFs. We've seen quite a bit of our clients actually moving into our balance portfolios where they do a 50-50 equity fixed income. They want to have some of that fixed income exposure. Look, we've talked about the rates that you can get on fixed income. You guys were just talking about clipping the coupon, not worrying about what Powell says on that. And there's definitely um, some positive uh, news that you can do for your portfolio by doing that. So we're seeing cash being put to work, both in equity, both in fixed income, and in our covered call writing strategy, our option strategy. <clears throat> People are looking for ways to generate income. Fixed income and options is a great way to do that for our clients. Cover call writing. Are you trapped there if we get another uh, 2023 where you, everything's taken away from you? I get the game. You get a premium. You get a yield uh, pickup. John, we use this in the triple leveraged all cash all How's the time. How's that working out? It, it worked out great last year, but come on. <laughs> You're going to get another lift in the equity market. Is covered call writing work? It does work depending on how you're writing those, right? So if you keep them short, 30, 60, 90 days at the there most is go. what we're doing right now. And um, rolling those over, you may lose a name here or there. Right. But it's been a, a great option for our clients generating double-digit cash. What you just heard there, folks, is gospel. And let me rephrase this for the delicate Ms. Fernandez. Don't be a pig. Because what you do, John, is you go out with covered call writing and you go, I can pop out 12 months or 18 months. I'm going to be a genius. And then, oops, they take Apple away from you. Let's and talk that's about not a Apple. Good idea. Earnings, yeah. early February. Let's get into it. Victoria, <clears throat> who's got pricing power at the moment? That's tough, Jonathan. I. You know, when you look at corporations as a whole, they are losing some of that pricing power. As you have the disinflation come in, as wages continue to stay high, these companies are losing their pricing power. We think it's going to affect margins across the board, and that's going to be one of the key themes for this earnings season. It's one of the reasons we think the market is probably going to have more of a pullback than what we've seen so far. But look, when you talk about Apple, we know that ecosystem. I can probably count three or four Apple items surrounding me right now in my home. They've sucked me in and I'm in there. I'm paying for the services. So once they get you locked in, that pricing right. power is there for them. So when it comes to Apple per se, I think they're probably better off in that category than a lot of other more global companies, especially um, like consumer companies. Victoria, a, a, a thing that's out there is healthcare stocks. This is a year because last year wasn't the year. Everybody said healthcare, United Healthcare, all the rest, Danaher, et cetera, are going to go. When do they go? What's the catalyst to make healthcare finally win? Yeah, you know, healthcare is a tough one, Tom, in an election year, right? Because there's a lot of volatility. But there is some opportunity here. Cigna, we own in our portfolios, it's one of our favorite names for this year. They were so beaten down over the last 12 months, but their balance sheets, you know, we always come back to balance sheets, are looking pretty good. So I think you can dip your toe in some of the healthcare names, put them in your portfolio, let them ride a little bit. You will have volatility as we get talk around election um, into regulation and pricing of drugs and different things. But we think you can have some good upside opportunities here. Like I said, Cigna being a, probably one of our favorites. Victoria, everything's said and done about this year was the shock of how everyone was wrong last year except Victoria Fernandez. <laughs> it's not going to be, I mean, we just heard this from Mike Schumacher at Wells Fargo, John. It's just not going to be that easy this year. So what's the strategy month by month for retail who just, you know, they own whatever they own and it went up beautifully last year. It's not going to happen. So where are you in March and April with your accounts to say patience? 
Yeah, patience is a wonderful uh, key word for our clients to have, but it's also diversification. And we don't just mean your general diversification. We mean go in, do your homework, dig in there. Where do we see opportunities? There's some names within the staples. If we're going to be a little more risk off, add a little bit of your staples name. Uh, we like financials. Obviously, banks reporting today. We think there's some upside there. JP Morgan being our favorite add some financials. We know the consumer at some point is going to get squeezed a little bit. So that risk off component is in there. Have some fixed income as we think yields might move a little bit higher as the market prices out multiple cuts that are in there right now. We just don't think the Fed is going to move as much as they are. And we also like to put um, a little bit of our equity market neutral um, strategies for our clients, an absolute return strategy <clears throat> to just kind of even out their portfolios. Victoria. Victoria, thank you. Appreciate the update from you and the team. Victoria Fernandez there of Crossmark Global Investments on earnings, on the equity market, on fixed income as well. <coughs> Something from Boeing, or rather on Boeing yeah. right now. Check out Boeing and Spirit Aerosystems in the pre-market. Boeing is down about 1.8%. This is the latest. The FAA says it's conducting audit of Boeing 737-9 MAX production lines and suppliers to evaluate Boeing's compliance with its approved quality procedures, according to an emailed statement. TK, results of the audit analysis will determine whether additional audits are necessary. You're talking real standard deviation moves where it unravels. Support here off of October of this year is a 180. We're at two, where are we? 218 right now. So we got room to move to get back to where they were before the bull market boom of just you know, a cup of coffee ago, four months ago. You wanted to know how quickly the 737-9 MAX would go back into surface I fully, am, Tom. The FAA says safety of the flying public, not speed, will determine the timeline for returning the Boeing 737-9 MAX back to service. In TK, I, some people were talking about maybe in a week, but based on what we're hearing there, who knows? I mean, you know, you can make jokes about it, but there's nothing funny here, and the FAA is stepping in. I should say they're also stepping in with a new leader who's got to prove himself and be visible on this. And I really, you know, I, I'm going to leave it up to a pro like George Ferguson or some of the great, Helene Becker and Steve Trent and the others, to tell me, so what do you do? You, you wheel the airplane in in Newark, you jack it up on the runway. What do you do, check every rivet? I mean, how does that work? But we stand 2%. Yeah. in the pre-market. Coming up on this program, <coughs> economic data, reaction to it. PPI, just around the corner. Mohammed Al Arian of Queen's College, Cambridge, with us for the next 30 minutes to close out this hour and this show. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. We had CPI yesterday. We've got PPI this morning to round out economic data for you. That data is about 20 seconds away. Here are the scores going into it. Equity futures on the S&P 500 look like this. We're negative by 0.3%. In the bond market, yields are a little bit higher by two basis points on a 10-year. Just short of 4%, 398.99 on a two-year, higher by two basis points to about 426. With the economic data, let's say good morning to Michael McKee. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John, and good morning to everyone out there with some good news on inflation. After yesterday's higher than expected CPI, we get a lower than anticipated PPI. PPI for final demand down a tenth of a percent. The forecast was for a tenth gain, and last month it was completely flat. The uh, core, X food and energy, is flat, and that was expected to be up two tenths of a percent. And X food, energy, and trade, which is kind of really the important core core of this number up two tenths of a percent that is on expectations well, and a little bit higher yields. than we'd seen so for the year over year number PPI goes up to 1% from 0.9%, uh, core 1.8%, and the ex food and energy and trade stays unchanged at 2.5%. Now, everybody says, does this mean good news for the future? There's not a direct correlation between the two, but PPI has been falling faster than CPI, so uh, we shall see. Now, the important thing to note is there are a number of categories within PPI that are used by economists to figure out what PCE is going to be, used by the, the government as well, including uh, health care right. data. And so um, the 
if, if we're basically in line here, it probably means that PCE right. is going to come in lower than CPI. And John, the revisions of PPI out seconds ago are also diminished over what they were 30 days ago. And Mike said it was good news. The market seems it the same way. Let's go through the boards. We'll start with equities, then to bonds, and then we'll get to foreign exchange. Equities turn around just a little bit. We're well off session lows. We're still down a touch on the S&P by almost 0.1%. After that, into bonds, yields were higher. Now they're lower at the front end by two basis points. Your two-year is 4.22. And the dollar, the euro against the dollar, was negative. We're just about unchanged now, 109.68. So the dollar giving up some of that strength. Mike McKee, you caught up with the Renamester of the Cleveland Fed yesterday. March <coughs> is too early. Is that the March Cleveland Fed view or the view on the FOMC? Oh, I think it's a much wider view than just the Cleveland Fed. Uh, they're going to want more data. Uh, obviously, we could see some big change in the data, right. but the data that we have been getting <laughs> kind of tells the same story. And so they don't need to cut in March. And unless the uh, economy slows significantly, they right. probably won't. But uh, it does set up May. Let me just note, the this is a services story in PPI today. Uh, Final demand services unchanged. Uh, final demand goods fell four tenths of a percent. That continues uh, a long trend. And the one thing that went up is uh, the thing that's been going up for quite some time, and that is securities brokerage dealing and investment. That increased 3.3 percent. The fees you're being charged well, to that's, trade. Well, that's John Day and trading Bitcoin. It is, it is kind of an interesting uh, right. point to make on a day when bank earnings are coming out. I want to squeeze this in before Dr. Larian. Ed Yodeni published late last night and made real clear X shelter inflation is disinflation. There's no shelter in PPI. So does this quiescent report suggest Yodeni's right? that basically there is disinflation in place except for a some shelter statistic? In a general sense, yes, it does. And it suggests that uh, we're going to see continued improvement in inflation, but how fast <clears throat> is the open question. Uh, before we go to Mohamed al Arian, I have to take a moment and congratulate him. Oh, wow. Because um, we've been talking about this for a long time. He's the man, uh, if you're an NFL fan and you don't like the New England Patriots, uh, the New York Jets are the team uh, that n not only does Muhammad follow, but they're the team that drove Bill Belichick out of the NFL by defeating him last weekend. His last NFL game until maybe he gets another job is a loss to the New York I'm Jets. I'm about to offend Jets fans across the city, so forgive me ahead of time. But that does speak a lot to where the New York Jets are at, that that's like the big <laughs> defining moment of their season. Well, I would bet you that uh, Muhammad well, is sitting there probably with a glass of champagne because it is important. Can Belichick coach the Jets? Why uh, not? He already, he, already, he already quit that job once. Okay. We are going to turn now to Muhammad uh, L. Arian at Queens College, Cambridge. And it is on economics, finance and investment. But today it's on something different. After the attacks we saw overnight, against uh, Houthi uh, rebels and terrorists, and of course their relationship to Iran. Mohammed, this goes back to Albert Harani and what we all learned about the history of the Arab people. Bahrain is one of our allies here. Would you suggest that the Arab nations are in support of this allied attack on these rebels? I would suggest they're nervous. You saw a statement by Saudi Arabia that is warning against escalation. And the concern here, Tom, is that other proxies, other Iranian proxies in the Middle East will see this as a reason to um, escalate what's going on in that region. So that's why you hear concern from the, the Arab countries. The last thing anybody wants is an escalation that becomes region-wide. Which institution can create a dialogue between Tehran and a Western world worried? I think first you, you need to see a cessation of hostilities in Gaza. That, that is a precondition. There, there, there won't be the ability to get people talking um, in a broader sense in the region until you get a cessation of hostilities in Gaza. Once you get that, then you know that the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran has improved. You know that the, the UEE um, plays a, a critical role in, in conversations among countries in the region. So, so there are parties that can help, but you need the precondition first. Mohammed, you warned in Project Syndicate recently not to extrapolate out 
the favorable trends that we finished last year with. Is there something that's developing in the Middle East right now that you think is a direct threat to that? It's one of the things, John. I mean, my major concern is that if you look at the three systemically important regions in the world, um, economically, the Eurozone, the US and China, all three are having issues growing in a robust manner. The US is the exception there, but even the US now is facing lower household savings, higher debt. China needs to fundamentally change its economic models. And we know that without a healthy Germany, Europe is going to struggle. So if you actually look at who is the locomotive of growth, it's very hard to point to one locomotive. Um, it's hard to believe that the US will be able to maintain what was very impressive growth rates. Now, put on top of that, the geopolitical concerns, and that's why this recency bias where people simply extrapolate what was a surprisingly good year from last year is something that we have to guard against. So you're questioning the resilient growth story. Are you also questioning the disinflationary trends, Mohammed, that have started to develop over the last 12 months? Yeah, I smiled when I heard the conversation before I came on that, you know, it's disinflation ahead. It's not. We're going to see, and we already are seeing, cost push pressures in the pipeline. There's two in particular. What's happened to nav navigation in the Red Sea is directly and indirectly increasing inflationary pressures, directly by hiking input prices, indirectly by causing shortages that then influence other prices. And then we have the labor market issue. We have higher labor costs coming through the pipeline. So you've got cost push pressures coming in. I suspect we will see inflation at the CPI level get stuck at 3%. And then the Fed is going to have to make a difficult decision, either tolerate it for longer. And I was encouraged by John Williams' use of the word, a longer term inflation target is 2% or try to reduce it to 2% too quickly and risk um, the real economy. But this notion that immaculate disinflation is going to continue is something that I find very hard to reconcile with actual data. Mohammed, you really challenge that theory. I think that we get a lot of people on this program, and I know you tune in and you've heard them say it, that the economy is rebalancing, this will continue, just give it time, we'll get there. You push back against that. I hear other people say things haven't changed. We will go back to the pre-2020 economic <clears throat> regime, low and stable inflation, growth in at around 2%. You really believe something has changed. What are the issues that you can point to, Mohammed, that you think have fundamentally changed since the pandemic? So, so I think it has fundamentally changed since um, what, what, what was before the pandemic. Coming out of the global financial crisis, we had major balance sheet damage. And that resulted in a decade of insufficient aggregate demand. There simply wasn't enough demand in the system. And when there isn't enough demand in the system, you pump in liquidity from the monetary side, from the fiscal side, and you don't have to worry about inflation. You boost up asset prices, and you get some growth response, but nothing really exciting. That was the story before the pandemic. Coming out of the pandemic, in addition, well in addition to the pandemic disruptions, we have four factors that are leading to insufficient aggregate supply. So it's a fundamental change in the macro environment. So what are those factors? We have fragmenting globalization, which means that supply chains are starting to be determined by geopolitical and not just commercial um, uh, reason. We have companies themselves looking for more resilience balance sheets, uh, more resilient supply chains after what happened during the pandemic. We have a significant transition on climate. And we have the labor market also, where labor force participation has not gone up as much as all of us wish. This is a world in which we are fragile to begin with on the supply side, and then right. you get the original shock. So that is a fundamental change. Uh, Mohammed, I'm not going to be at Davos. I'm going to be watching QPR at Watford this week and really looking forward uh, to that. <laughs> Mohammed's but, not. <laughs> you know, my, I'm sorry, but I'll be there. Mohammed, if I was in Davos, my banner for the year would be it's cost of carry Davos. What's fundamentally changed off of your good analysis there moments ago 
is all of a sudden money costs something. Every single business and family out there has a new cost of money. How's our world going to change a year out with this new new after the free lunch of the last decade? Yeah, and, and the issue is, is the legacy of the free lunch. I think on a flow basis, we can deal with the higher cost of money. The problem is the stock. And, and we know there are three major areas that somehow have to be refinanced and you've got to get volume back. One is the US housing market, where the higher, the higher mortgage rate is just stopping people from moving. And it's very hard to get into, onto the housing ladder right now because you're not getting the flow you need. Second is commercial real estate. There's a trillion plus that has to be refinanced and some of it cannot be refinanced at what is assumed in terms of value. And then the third area that needs to do is we have a wall of corporate maturities coming up in 2025 and companies normally try to get ahead of it. So if we can deal with the stock issue, with the legacy of this borrowing that occurred when rates were artificially low, we can deal with the flow aspect. The flow aspects, Tom, don't worry me. We just have to deal with the stock. Mohammed, we'll continue this conversation. Do you want to tell Tom about QPR or should I? No, I, I really don't want to get depressed and start crying on it. Relegation zone, TK. Really? Relegation zone. Can the Jets be relegated? I mean, they are they're... like the Jets of English football in the championship really? right now. Yeah, not there's, great. And there's a level below them. They can go down a league, yeah. This is not looking good for QPR. Well, you know, Mr. Rubenstein's rumored to be looking at the Baltimore Orioles. I think I keep Professor, saying to Mohammed. I said Professor to Mohammed, Alarian, I mean, if, come on. If they get relegated, can we get some kind of consortium together and take out QPR? Yeah, that's what I, you know, get some movie I actor involved that watches us every day. It'd be you know, great. Mohammed's in the and UK And you could do now. the Ted Lasso thing. You could sure, go over and do it. I could go and coach the team or coach, something. I'm not sure it. anyone at QPR wants that. I'm not sure QPR <laughs> I know Mohammed Alarian doesn't that want either. that. Mohammed's going to stick with us. The brilliant Mohammed Alarian of Queen's College Cambridge to round out the week, TK. To round out this morning as well. So PPI comes in a bit better than expected. Equity's almost unchanged on the session in the bond market, Tom. Yields are a little bit lower at the front end. We're down five basis points on a two-year. Man, Boeing struggling as well. Another story tangential after the huge bank earnings report today. From New York City this morning, good morning. <clears throat> When you go back in modern financial history, there's only been one quote unquote soft landing. And part of our concern right now is that unlike this time last year, when everyone thought recession was imminent, mm -hmm. no one thinks uh, recession is imminent. And when you think about that kind of drawdown, the average non-recession year drawdown is 13%. That was Julian Emanuel of Evercore looking potentially for a rocky path ahead in 2024. The team led by Ed Hyman looking for recession, I believe, in the middle of this year. If you are just joining us, equity futures just about unchanged on the S&P 500, going into the opening bell about 44 minutes away. Yields are a little bit higher on a 10-year maturity, but at the front end of the curve on a two-year, we're down five basis points. PPI a little bit softer than anticipated. Going against the grain a bit with CPI coming out a bit hotter than expected yesterday, but encouraging the view that the Federal Reserve can reduce interest rates sometime soon. We had bank earnings a little bit earlier this morning. Allow me to go through just one of them for you. JP Morgan earnings at this morning, TK, but it's all about the outlook from that bank. <coughs> yeah. The outlook is better than expected, and the stock turned higher off the back of that information. In the pre-market right now, JP Morgan, Tom, up by 2%. And I would suggest even at Davos with their annual soiree, John, they're going to have to manage the excellence that they've under. They've got to underplay profitability. They've got to underplay dominance. They've got to underplay what we see tick by tick, as Shanali said, they stand alone. It's so, so it's difficult to forecast this to year. It. Imagine trying to forecast this year, Tom the next 12 right. months. All the elections around the world, the tension in the Middle East, the expectations that the Federal Reserve is going to re reduce interest rates six times, may well start in March. Right. Got to reconcile a lot of things. Well, we're going to have to see. We continue with Mohammed El Arian. And John, this is just wonderful after the accolade he has received from Dubai and an award given to him for all of his commitment to the Arab world and to economics as well. Uh, Dr. Alarian's father, the former Egyptian ambassador to France a few years uh, ago. And, and I guess I could start with Dr. Alarian. 
I know what Dubai was like the first time I was there, Mohammed, and the growth just since I've been there is extraordinary. What was Dubai like the first time you were there? So that's gonna expose my age, but I was there first time in the 80s and there was nothing there. There was absolutely nothing there to see what there is in Dubai right now. And it's a combination, Tom, as you know, of vision, leadership and agility. And those three things have delivered something that, that is much admired. I was really surprised um, to learn, for example, that more people go to the Dubai Mall, more, more tourists go to the Dubai Mall than they do to New York. That's an incredible statistic. I, I still can't, can't get over it. How do they sustain the Persian Gulf, in, in, to use a phrase from the British years ago, the tribal structure? How do they get to nation and in institutional solidity a generation or two beyond where we are now? Well, they've done it. I mean, Dubai's done it, Abu Dhabi's done it, the UAE, which is the seven emirates, um, have done it. And they've done it through very consistent, wise leadership. And that has allowed them to position themselves as a, a, a major trading hub, B, a major hub for people, um, a lot of people transit through Dubai on, 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 the, on the local airlines. And third, increasingly, a hub for, fin for finance. And it's this long-term vision. It, it, it reminds me of Singapore. Um, it's the same approach that they've had and the same agility, always looking at what's happening outside them and recognizing that they are small and they just have to keep agile. The UE really has shown incredible progress. Mohammed, this was Tom's way of saying congratulations. Um, congratulations, by the way, for being named the great Arab Minds winner. The quote, and I'll share it with our audience, for your exceptional contributions to the field of economics and your perspective analysis of changes in economic and financial systems, perceptive analysis. Mohammed, let's talk about some of that perceptive analysis right now. The financial system, I want to go back to last year just briefly. I remember the banks that were failing and you would come on the program with me and I would refer to it as a crisis and you would say, this is not a crisis. Just how resilient is this system and how well do you think it's standing up to this aggressive rate hiking cycle that started not so long ago? I think if you look at it as a system, it's highly resilient. And if you look at JP Morgan's results today, it will show you how resilient um, they've been. It's really impressive what, what that bank keeps on delivering quarter after quarter. Um, the system as a whole is very resilient. There are some, some banks that are fragile. Um, they, they make mistakes. And if it wasn't for the fact that we de facto changed deposit insurance in March of last year, we would have a few more of the mid-sized banks come under pressure. But the change in deposit insurance has ma made it possible to contain the crisis. But the system as a whole is, is strong. I don't worry about the banks. I worry about the non-banks. But the banks, I think, are, are strong. I look, Mohammed, at the core economic course at the University of Cambridge, and you got to go in there and give some central bank theory. I can see Dr. Larry and wandered in with a chalk in a hand saying, OK, forget about ISLM and all that. We're going to rip up the Phillips curve and move forward. Do we have an operative central bank theory right now or post pandemic? Is it completely ad hoc? Um, we, ha we, we, we have a theory of central banks. I think reaction functions have become ad hoc. You know, the word, you, the phrase you hear most often is data dependent, data dependent, <laughs> which is quite curious because everybody acknowledges that the measures act with lags. So the fact that you are operating with measures with lags based on, on historical data is a little bit strange. But what, what you see lacking, which is very different from the Bernanke Fed, it's very different from the Yellen Fed, certainly from the Greenspan Fed, is a vision of where this whole thing is going. Um, the Fed today is very short term and just keeps on repeating data dependent, data dependent. Right. I mean, John, this is really important. Alarian and I had a Kufel and Usser slide roll when we started out doing this. Alarian demands at Queens College a university approved scientific calculator estimated cost 25 to 35 dollars. Is that how much they That's are? That's how he's tough. How much they are. Mohammed, let's finish on Fed policy. Expectations they go in March. What's your gauge of what the threshold is to begin to reduce interest rates and how close do you think we are to it? 
there's no reason they should go in March. Um, I think the market is over optimistic, both in terms of timing and in terms of the amount of cuts we're going to get. I think the market should listen to the Fed when it says signals around three 25 basis point cuts and starting later than March. I think it'll be the summer when they start. Mohammed, appreciate the update and congratulations on the award. Thank you, sir. It's good to hear from you. Mohammed Al Arian of Queen's College, Cambridge, TK and the Federal Reserve. March <clears throat> is too early. Yeah, the operative theory here is interesting. And, you know, I'd go back to that phrase I was saying about Davos, cost to carry for everybody, including Jerome Powell. Facts have changed. The single sentence today that shows you how things have changed is from Shanali Basak, who summarizes a 47 whatever page PowerPoint from Jane Frazier. They're popping from 240,000 employees down to 180,000. My fancy surveillance math is that 60,000 bodies out the door over the next number of medium term years. Only Vasek knows is what, what medium term means. That's wow. What are you looking for next week from Morgan Stanley from Goldman? Uh, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how Morgan Stanley develops a dialogue post James Gorman. That's the number one thing I'm uh, looking at within it is they are not traditional banks. And, and Mr. Solomon has learned this the hard way, having to pick up the pieces there of their banking experiment. But what I would look for them uh, next week is a different story than what we heard today. Today was maybe what we predicted. J.P. Morgan just continues to move forward and the others each have their own challenges, to say the Do least. Do you want to start the weekend early? This was <clears throat> special. Start the weekend early? We're off Monday. You know, yeah, long weekend. You know, you're traveling. It's, I didn't know until yesterday that we're off Monday. We're off Monday, long weekend. We're off Monday. And, you know, we're going to digest it all and, and, and see what goes on here. I think the one thing we haven't mentioned today, because John and I don't believe in it, is Bitcoin. And the, and the, and the answer is it popped up. Hey, don't drag me into that list. 49,000. I loaded the boat at 49,000 looking for that 50K print. Oops. Right back down. Equity Tell futures. Me. Let's turn to stocks. Don't yeah. put me on that list with you. I don't want anything to do with it. On the S&P 500, totally unchanged. Equities going absolutely nowhere. Yields are unchanged on a 10-year or so. 396.72 at the front end of the curve. We've got to move, though. Down another five basis points. It's a break of 420. It's 419 as PPI comes in. A little bit softer than expected. TK, do me the honor. Take us out to break. No, the real yield here. I mean, folks, you look at the real yield. 1.71% uh, really, really extraordinary to see that. A break of 170 there is a huge deal. And I would suggest the real yield is technically very elegant right now. That's the number one thing I would watch into next week. Good morning.